Welcome to another edition of Kansas Football Friday. It is week number five for high school football across the great state of Kansas. I'm your host for Kansas Football Friday, presented by Sports in Kansas. I'm Leon Liebel, along with Chet Kuplin from Sports in Kansas. As again, we'll be checking in with live action, scores, re- live reports, live interviews, and much, much more, including maybe uh, some well, useful trivia or maybe not so useful trivia between uh, Chet and I as we produce that tonight. But, Chet, good to see you again. It is week number five, and, gosh, we're over halfway done with this high school football season. We're already in the district play in some areas and some classes. Yeah, it's exciting week number five in the season, but uh, unfortunately we still don't know a lot about a lot of teams this year due to the unknown, the uncertainty. Uh, we've talked a lot about teams being quarantined for a couple weeks, players being quarantined. Some teams have a couple games in. Some teams, they're going to play their number, you know, game number five tonight as well. You mentioned district play. Uh, we're in the thick of that as well. Of course, 4A, 5A, 6A, uh, not in district play as uh, everybody makes the playoffs in week nine of that. So we're starting to figure out a little bit more about some high school football teams across the state. I'm just glad we've made it to week five already because before we know it, it's going to be November and we're going to be talking high school football playoffs in the state of Kansas. But uh, right now we got to worry about week number five, some big matchups, some matchups happening tomorrow as well, some last minute cancellations, some last minute, minute additions things like that uh, but I'm ready to go for week number five of football Friday night and we definitely are ready to go and again we're going to be b- bouncing all across the state of Kansas every uh, corner of the state for games and uh, we'll be starting off with these four games as they are getting ready to go and upper left hand corner that is going to be Kansas City Piper at no wait that one is looks like Rossville oh, in Yes, that's going to Oscaloosa be Ross, in the top left. Oscalo- Oscaloosa in our top left. And our game number three in the uh, top right will be Pittsburgh uh, at Capon. And our feature game, a big one in eight-man football, it is Little River at Canton Galva. Canton Galva uh, ranked number one in class uh, in eight-man uh, division one. As uh, We've already got a score on the board. Canton Galva, the Eagles of a long run, have taken – an eight to nothing lead. They got the two point conversion there against a Little River. So that's a good one that we got to keep an eye on because Little River also, I believe, uh, is ranked in class eight man division one. Yeah, Little River, of course, a very good program, a very good basketball team a year ago. A lot of good athletes with Jaden Garrison and Graham Stevens, both on this team, as you see in that bottom right hand corner. But if you remember, Canton Galva, 4 0, they are the defending eight man one state champion. Their only state championship in school history for football last year. And if you remember that one last year, Leon, in the second quarter of that game, St. Francis was up 36 to nothing against these guys. And they came back and won the state championship 66 to 36. Not only did they pull a Kansas City Chiefs, they put an explanation point on that. And of course, Tyson Struber. Their star for Canton Galva, he has a Kansas State and KU offer, just a junior, last year's eight-man one, defensive player of the year from sports in Kansas. He could have been offensive well, but his teammate was Landon Everett. Landon has graduated, and now in his spot is sophomore quarterback Garrett Maltby. Also look for uh, the Collins kid as well of Canton Galva, but uh, the Eagles flying high there, and of course a really good program and uh, should be an outstanding game here, hopefully, Canton Galva and Little River. Yeah, Cannon Galva after that opening touchdown, now kicking off there in the all-blue. Little River in the all-white. Michael Quaid of Kansas Football Friday. He's on the scene providing us with the uh, video highlights throughout the night. Also in game number three, that is your lower left-hand corner. Now that is Hoxie at Oberlin, Decatur County. And, of course, Hoxie has uh, the big guy, Harlan Oboya. We've talked about him several times this season, the big seven-footer. Is he seven-foot now? He was listed as 6'11". <laughs> I see something different every time. It, it's six foot eleven, six eleven and a half, seven foot. All I know is he is huge. A, and you can see him number seventy four and playing right tackle on that. He'll play a little bit of nose tackle. He'll play DN. But not only that, he's pretty athletic for a big guy. He does need to get stronger in the weight room. But he's twenty one points per game in basketball. He's a sports in Kansas All State pick in basketball in Class Two A last year. You see him on the right side there. 
uh, with the kick out block the last time. He, he's very athletic. He'll get a lot stronger, and I believe he has 11 FBS offers at this point. And this team, of course, won a state title a few years back. There is number 74 on the uh, top of your screen. They're blocking as they come the other way with the football. Meanwhile, they back to that Canton Galva Little River game. Little River uh, taking its opening possession and starting to march down the field. They just had a long run. Again, Canton Galva up eight to nothing in this football game early in this battle of eight man Division One powers. Little River with the football and the pitch out to the right side and. Uh, Kind of fun to watch an eight-man game for once. So yeah, Little River, of course, uh, a storied program uh, for years and a very good program back in the 90s, early 2000s. Of course, maybe not quite as good, Leon, as their girls' basketball team and Coach Shane Cordell, who won, of course, 91 games in a row back in the day. And that's the team Jackie Styles and Claflin could never overcome back then, back in 1A basketball back in the day. And that team was so good in 1A basketball, they were beating 5A, 6A, 4A, 2A state champs, McPherson County in that area of basketball, so good back in that day. Yeah, Little River has always been a very good athletic town, a good sports town. I mean, going way back into the 70s, Little River had some really good boys basketball teams, and uh, you mentioned those girls teams. They had some, they had a, some really good twins on those teams that used to beat uh, Jackie Styles. I cannot remember their names, but they were fun to watch. Amber, Amber, ah. and Amy Prose, <laughs> along there you go. with uh, Nick along with Nikki Ramage, who played at Kansas State. And, of course, the great Sandra Myers, who was an Olympian in That's Spain, right. was, uh, of course, a really good athlete. She she married uh, a guy from Spain and got citizenship and competed in the Olympics uh, back, I believe, in the 1980s. But, of course, uh, high school track and field All-American still, I believe, several records if they've not been converted from yards or whatever back in the day from, from Little River. So definitely uh, some storied athletes uh, of this small school. Yeah, she's a Kansas. Uh, she's in the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame as well. As uh, once again, her alma mater, Little River, moving the football. You're trying to tie this game against Canton Galva. Canton Galva up eight to nothing early. They scored on their first possession, a long run, got the two point conversion, and now Little River at the football, all white, the visiting team. On another beautiful Friday night for football across the state. We've had terrific weather. Here come the. Little River Redskins and just out of bounds, just short of the goal line, not a touchdown. So Little River will have the ball right there at the goal line. First and goal, And that's Jaden Jade Garrison on the carry. He was the Sports in Kansas uh, Basketball Player of the Year in his classification last year. Of course, they were one of those final four teams that had their season canceled. A very good player for them, and he's kind of a quarterback as well as Graham Stevens is number three, as you see there. Graham, about 5'9", five, 5'10", five, five, a little bit thicker than that of Garrison. Garrison's got a little speed to him as well. So this is a very athletic team here that you see. Uh, but also up front, these guys are getting it done because Canton Galva is a very physical football team to be able to move the football on them like this. In eight-man Division One football, Little River at Canton Galva. Little River trying to get in the end zone, and it looks like they do. It crosses the goal line, touchdown, Little River. In this video being provided by Kansas Football Friday, our photographer extraordinaire, field producer Michael Quaid out there, Little River to, or at Canton Galva tonight. And they'll go for two and try to tie this game. And I can guarantee you right now, Leon, there are a lot of teams in Class 1A football. 1A is very top-heavy. There are a lot of teams in 1A football that would want no part of either one of these teams if they decided to play 11-man football. And here's the two-point conversion. And it's going to throw it into the end zone and incomplete. And so Cannon Galvo will hang on to the lead here, 8-6, to six, as we break out into our four games going on across the state or across uh, on our screen as we uh, continue to check in on live action throughout the night. We'll be all over the state. We're gonna check on a number of games, not just these four. This is the four we start off with, as right now we take a look at Hoxie at uh, Oberlin Decatur. Hoxie on the move here. Or are they going for two? It's six to nothing. And uh, they get it into the end zone across the goal line and Oh, it's zero, 0 My my fault. I read the wrong number there, but uh, not. Did they not? Did they lose the ball there? Let's check out the replay here. And again, that's in your lower left. Fumbled the football, and Hoxie loses it. Wow, that's a big turnover there. 
So once again, you're watching Kansas Football Friday, presented by Sports in Kansas. I'm Leon Liebel, along with Chet Kaplan. Chet, fresh off the road with one of his uh, social media tours and uh, all across southwest Kansas this week. And let's check uh, Chet's Kansas top ten for week number five. Chet? Yeah, and kind of threw this uh, together today of uh, kind of where I thought everybody was at at this point. Of course, I think Aquinas may be that best team uh, in the state at this point. Uh, they still got a lot to prove, but very physical offensive line. They have one of the two top backs in the state and Tank Young, an outstanding player. Of course, you look at Lawrence. They're going to play tomorrow against Carroll. Devin Neal, one of the state's top players. Wichita Northwest was in the right corner of our screen. I actually uh, put them wrong as 6A. They are a 5A program and have been in the last two state titles. Number four is Mill Valley. You know, they've taken a couple losses. Their quarterback's been hurt, but those aren't bad losses. Uh, Bishop Miege, of course, is Bishop Miege, and we got to have them into the conversation. They be, may be a team that right now, you know, Maybe 0-2 on the season, but I still think that they're more than capable of winning a 4A state title. Derby, maybe not the same Derby from last year, but they're still certainly a contender. Bishop Carroll and Lawrence tomorrow, as I mentioned. Olathe North, still a little bit of a question mark to me, uh, with, of course, uh, losing their key player, transferring up to, to Iowa and Arlen Bruce. We saw Junction City in week number one. They look very good. And then number 10, I couldn't pick between the two because an <laughs> outstanding victory with Gardner Edgerton last week, I thought – they really had an outstanding win, and then Blue Valley Northwest and Clint Ryder have really been off to a good 2-0 start as well. So I thought both of those teams deserved that spot there. As we go into you know the small schools here, I think Andell is head and shoulders better than everybody in 3A through 1A. I think Hayden is another team to look at as well. Of course, they lost to Perry in the semifinals. Perry, Thad Metcalf has had to step up big now. He's playing quarterback because William Welch out for the year. Holton is Holton. Rossville on our screen tonight. They're very powerful. Wichita Collegiate, not a lot of people talking about them. The Fair Brothers, very good athletes for them. Silver Lake wins 91 to nothing last week. Silver Lake, Silver Lake. Hoisington's a team that not a lot of people are talking about in the, the Central Kansas League, and they should be. They have four or five running backs over 200 yards. Southeast of Celine and Jackson Gibhart having a very good season. And then Cheney, they're 4 0 on the season, and they move into my top 10 this week. How about their 51 yard field goal last week uh, by their senior? I thought that was uh, outstanding in seeing that. Of course, the top 10, top five, and eight man. You look at Canton Galva there on our screen tonight. They are outstanding. You know, Little River was a team that I considered here, and maybe I, I favored putting Wichita County on here because I just spoke there earlier this week. In St. Francis, I spoke there as well. Uh, St. Francis down to eight-man two. Shadron Blanca, one of the top backs in the state. Linebackers, Hanover with a huge victory over Axtell last week. I really like Madison a lot this year. Hunter Engel, one of the top players in eight-man. But Wichita County's had an addition to Manny Chavez, who transferred from Tribune Greeley County, set out last year, and he's a big weapon. We saw him hurdle a guy on the Open Space Sports broadcast a couple weeks ago. He's a very big weapon for Cade Ritzke this year. So I look for Wichita County to make a serious push. Maybe Leota Wichita County could be that West team to meet up with Canton Galva in the eight-man one state title. But top heavy in eight-man one and eight-man two. Hey, going back to your overall ratings, uh, you had Bishop Miege up there, of course, and they got a, a pretty a big game tonight. We hope maybe to check in on them later, but taking on a fellow Catholic uh, team in uh, Johnson County, their St. James Academy. Yeah, that could be an outstanding game. It really has the making of being one, of course, last year. St. James beat Bishop Miege, and nobody saw that happening. And, you know, that's part of the problem with the Eastern Kansas League. And, and I've said this, and I've been repetitive about it on multiple radio shows in these broadcasts over the weeks. I've said, you can't count out any EKL team. I mean, there may be one year where you're 1-8, and eight, then the next year, what? You're like Clint Ryder, and you're 2-0, and oh, and you beat Blue Valley. It's the same way for St. James. They are in that same league. They play very good competition week in and week out. So when they see these teams, it's nothing that they haven't already seen. So sometimes you're going to sneak up on somebody. Of course, now, Leon, we kind of got to factor in St. James into 4A because all of a sudden mm -hmm. St. James may have a bad record. Well, they jump from 5A to 4A, and they're certainly going to be a contender and a competitor within that. And both of those teams, Miege, of course, and St. James Academy, both in Class 4A this year, and I believe – game uh, at home for St. James Academy. So we'll see what happens in that one because Miege is a team right now that is 0-2 on the season. Now, we can say that, but Miege also plays a really good schedule, so we really can't factor in that because, of course, one loss is a six-point loss to Randy Dryling and Aquinas, and it may be a blowout last week, but they lost to Rockers, so we can't really judge them on that 0-2 record. 
And Gardner Edgerton, you had them tied for 10th overall. They have a pretty interesting game, too. They take on Olathe North tonight. Hopefully, we'll check in on that and see if Ryan Cornelson's team can follow up. They had the big surprise last week with a victory over Mill Valley. Yeah, and and back-to-back victories, one in overtime at Olathe South in uh, really what should have been week three, but it was week one for them because their first two games were canceled. And I know at one point, Mark Semino, the strength and conditioning coordinator there, former NFL veteran, Smith Center, Kansas, he is their strength and conditioning coach, and he called me, said, hey, we need a game for week four. We can't find a game. He was even looking at Pittsburgh and different things like that. and They couldn't find a game. Well, all of a sudden, Mill Valley lost Lawrence because Lawrence had to go in quarantine for for two weeks. And Mill Valley and, of course, Gardner Edgerton wasn't a game that was on the schedule. So that's even more impressive. You scheduled a team that's won three state titles since 2015, and not only that, you go to their place – and you beat them on the road in your second game of the year. And, of course, you're playing some young guys as well. I know, of course, Mill Valley's quarterback was hurt against Bentonville, and they were playing a sophomore, and maybe he was rusty. But you're still playing a lot of guys that played and won a 5A state championship from a year ago. So an outstanding win for Coach Cornelson and the Trailblazers. And, again, they're playing Olathe North, and you mentioned Arlen Bruce, Olathe North's outstanding player who transferred to Iowa. He has finally been declared eligible to play at that high school he transferred to in Iowa. He, he was sitting out uh, for the last few weeks, so he'll I assume he'll be on the field tonight up there in Iowa as we uh, once again check in at Canton Galva. Little River at uh, Canton Galva. It's is an 8-6 to six game as uh, Canton Galva scored on its first possession. Little River followed up with a touchdown, failed on the extra the Extra point attempt, the two-point conversion, so that's why it's 8-6 to six early in this game. Looks like we have an injured player on the field. That's a Little River player. Hope he's okay. As yeah, and, and part of, and part of that, Leon, that you look at some of these players that have transferred out, you know, that they've left because their programs weren't playing. And I don't blame the kids, but then all of a sudden after they left, their programs decided to play. So Yeah, it's kind of a show Arlen game Bruce they got leaving. there. Yeah. <laughs> you got Arlen Bruce leaving, and then all of a sudden, you know, they've already played three games, and he's been sitting out for four weeks. So, you know, that, that's been part of the problem. And, you know, Piper wasn't going to play at one point, and then they weren't going to do in, you know, in school or in person for, for school, and then they lost a couple players off their team. So it's been like the Wild West, Leon, where you're from. <laughs> and by the way, Bishop Meage has scored to take a 6 to nothing lead over St. James Academy. Their extra point attempt there failed, but there's a flag on that uh, flag on the play and see if they kick that over or not. But, uh, yeah, it's been a, obviously a crazy time for sports and high school football. And early on, when I think it was Olathe, Blue Valley, Wichita City League, the public schools were not going to play, and a lot of kids did transfer or made arrangements to transfer, and then those districts – reverse field and they are playing and Bishop Miege is going to get another shot here at the extra point as the flag was on the play and this one time it's good and so Bishop Miege the Stags take a seven to nothing lead over St. James Academy we'll keep an eye on that game throughout the night once again back to Canton Galva Little River with the football trying to take the lead in this game and this is a good matchup between these two Canton Galva Number one in eight men in Division One. Little River, as we know, of only uh, three and one on the year. Good football team. By the way, Arlen Bruce. Little River. Uh, no, Arlen Bruce was a big loss for Olathe North. I, I wanted to get back to him a little bit. He was the last year's Simone Award winner. And for people not familiar, that's the that's the best player in the Kansas City metro area, both sides of the state line. It's kind of the Heisman Trophy winner of, of the Kansas City metro. That's a big deal. So that was a big loss for Olathe North. Yeah, that, that's, that's harder to win that award than it is to win the 6A Player of the Year from sports in Kansas in Kansas, or maybe for that matter, to win the all classes player of the year. He was our non-senior player of the year uh, last year in the state. But whenever you start to throw in some of those big time Kansas City, Missouri schools, your Rockers is your Lee Summit schools, of course, your Blue Springs and and all those powerful schools up there. And he was the best player in the Metro. And you can go back and look and, you know, Josh Freeman's won that. Bubba Starling's won that. Devin, uh, Darren Sproles. Uh, has won that. The list goes on and on of some of the, the great players that have won the Thomas A. Simone Trophy over the years. So it, incredible uh, to, to see that. But Bishop Miege, very explosive, a lot of speed. Really goes through their quarterback who had 3,000 yards passing a year ago in Timothy Dorsey. He, of course, is headed to the FCS level. 
I believe, Illinois State and has multiple offers in uh, – Probably not maybe the, the, as powerful up front maybe as they have been in recent time or maybe as many D1 guys as they've had, but this is still the team that is the favorite, in my opinion, to win Class 4A football. There's other teams there that are contenders, whether that's St. James right now, whether that is, of course, Paola, who we see beat Tongi a few weeks ago. I think both of those teams are there as well. Uh, but that Miege team going to be so battle-tested by the time that they get to the playoffs in Week 9. Hey, by, by the way, uh, getting back to the Simone Award, also, the ceremony is huge. It's always at the uh, school with the player who wins it. And they, try, they try to surprise the player, but it is um, unbelievable who shows up. The former Kansas City Chiefs, current Kansas City Chiefs, it's a big, big deal uh, to win that. And they, they also give out other awards, you know, best defensive player, best offensive player. And uh, it's, it's a terrific experience for those uh, young men. As uh, once again, you're watching Kansas Football Friday presented by Sports in Kansas as we check in on live action across the state on this week number five of Friday Night Football Action. Camden Galvin now with the football back as once again they lead eight to six in this eight man battle against the Little River. Canton Galva at home tonight, the Eagles, and they're all blue uniforms. And number 21 on your screen there, Leon, as you see, that is Tyson Struber. He's six two and a half, 190 pounds, a 4'4", 40. Of course, verified at some camps that we had this summer. He has KU and K-State offers, as you see him split out there. He'll come in the backfield as well, and arguably just as good of a defensive player, defensive back as he is an offensive player. He has been on the map since he's been a freshman. Of course, his older brother played at Washburn, an offensive lineman. Uh, but Tyson Struber is a very explosive athlete, and it's not often that you see a six foot three, almost 190 pound, four four kid in eight man football. So he is definitely one to watch on your screen. Number 21 in the blue. Hey, a score from the Wichita City League early. Wichita Heights has taken a six to nothing lead over Wichita East, and I think that's somewhat significant. I believe that's the first time East has been scored on in two games this football season. The Blue Ace is kind of out to a well, a bit of a surprising start as they have come. Bring up some big, big scores the last couple of weeks. And they've added a lot of transfers uh, in the offseason. I believe Bryce Brown, former NFL player, that their offensive coordinator. So some new coaches, different things like that. As they go to Braden Collins there for the big play there, and that kid's a weight room beast well, out of the backfield, but also can catch it in a big-time play there. Everybody talks about Struber. But they also have Raiden Collins on the team, and he's a big-time player on this team, one of the strongest players in eight-man Division I football with a big play there, making the touchdown to put him up 14-6 to here with 4-18 remaining in the first quarter. And Canton Galva up on uh, Little River, and they'll go for another two-point conversion, it looks like. As, uh, once again, 14-6 to over Little River. Canton Galva, the number one team, ranked team in eight-man Division I, 4-0. Going for two, and they got it, and that'll make it a 16 to six lead for Canton Galva over Little River. And once again, we're at uh, Bishop Miege at uh, St. James. Bishop Miege with the early seven nothing lead, and I think they just came up with an interception. That was a great catch over the shoulder. And this is a home game for St. James Academy, but it's being played at Bishop Miege. They use their field, I believe, uh, quite a bit. I always forget. I don't think that they have their own field uh, for St. James Academy. And that is a big, big turnover. St. James Academy going with a long, deep pass and a terrific interception there, a terrific catch. as Once again, over the shoulder catch. And Miege with that 7 nothing lead now with the football after the turnover. Yeah, Miege is always uh, so good at every single position, not average really at any position. That's, you know, a few years ago I went and watched them play Pittsburgh High, and Pittsburgh High had a really good Class 4A team with a couple kids that went on to Division One football. And, of course, uh, Miege, they were during their six titles. They've won six in a row in 4A or 4A1, going for their seventh this year. And the one thing I noticed was, was offensive line play was the difference between a normal pretty good 4A team uh, and just so much depth on that team. It seems like they, of course, you know, could two platoon, and uh, they weren't really average in any spot. A lot of 4A high school football teams, you'll have some average spots that you're at or maybe guys that have to play two ways. 
When you go to Bishop Mies, there's not a lot of guys playing two ways. The offensive linemen are big, strong, physical, and then you go on the other side of the ball, they got different guys on that defense, and they got twos that are that way as well. So I think the depth maybe is the, the difference. Uh, and then maybe, of course, uh, the level of play, level of competition that some of those schools are playing whenever maybe you go down and play a Fort Scott or a Labette County or a Lewisburg. Those are good programs. But, of course, they're not used to playing week in and week out Class 6A Blue Valley or 5A Aquinas or Mill Valley uh, like that. So Miege definitely flexes its muscles when they get to those Class 4A playoffs. And I believe this is Rossville, Oskaloosa. Is that right? Yeah, Oskaloosa and, uh, and Rossville here. Yeah, Rossville up 21 to nothing. And, uh, of course, Oskaloosa, the victim of a 96 to nothing loss against Silver Lake last week. Had to take a few double takes on that score when it came down. As we're back to Canton Galva, or Little River at Canton Galva, and Little River with the football trying to bounce back after giving up another touchdown, down 16 to 6 in this game. Lower left, uh, or actually, yeah, we're at the full screen, so it's Little River and Canton Galva you're watching right now. Yeah, Jaden Garrison, the player to look at here. He's got 140 passing this year. He's got 351 rushing. He plays a little quarterback as well, as does Graham Stevens. So 3-10, and 10, when you're in the backfield, you really have two quarterbacks uh, that can both switch spots. So very dangerous when you go to the option with either one of these guys, either one can throw. As you can see, the power uh, there for Graham Stevens, the senior. He's got, of course, 180 yards passing this year, as well as 276 yards on the ground as well. So that's one of the better backfields you will see in eight-man one football. So outstanding play in the backfield by Little River. And from central Kansas, uh, northwest Kansas, as we were just checking in there, of Oberlin, uh, Decatur County, taking on Hoxie. The Red Devils on the move. That's in your lower left now. Hey, here's a score update. We're just talking about Gardner Edgerton. Uh, they are trailing seven to nothing against Olathe North. Olathe North on top, seven to nothing to start the second quarter. A game we'll be keeping an eye on. As again, Gardner Edgerton, kind of a surprise uh, in this season, uh, knocking off Mill Valley a week ago. Little River, not much there. Trying to go up the middle against Canton Galva. As you may have heard there, third down coming up. A big third down play for Little River. So we're talking about Little River's uh, athletic tradition and football, girls basketball and boys basketball. It's amazing. And we've talked about this a lot, Chad, especially when we were doing the state track and field meet, how schools with good teams in one sport have a tendency to, to be good all across the board, especially the smaller schools where the kids just seem to play everything. Yeah, and a lot of success, breeding off success. And then, you know, you're one of those kids in the fourth and fifth grade and you, you see those older kids and that's what you want to be like. And sometimes it's like a factory in some of these places where you just see year after year success after success. And certainly every program, you know, hits a drought or things like that. But I mean, can you imagine a, a team like CJ Hamilton and Silver Lake? You know, this guy's been there for 40 plus years, the all time state's wins leader. And imagine everything that he's seen. I mean, he's got 61, 62 year old men that played for him that are out in society now. That's how long that that guy's been coaching. And uh, it, it's quite remarkable, quite incredible uh, to see. And, you know, that's just one program in, in Kansas has had success. And a lot of that sometimes, Leon, is having coaches. You know, we talked about C.J. Hamilton or your Chuck Smith that was at Colgan or your Roger Barta. Of course, some of those guys, of course, have, have retired several years ago by now. But sometimes it's that coach that's there for a long time, whether that's Centralia's volleyball coach or you know, a track and field or cross country coach has been there forever and brings all the titles and then all of a sudden they move on and maybe that success stops after a while. So that's oftentimes we, we don't really appreciate maybe coaching styles or philosophies or coaches sometimes because, you know, some of these programs are like factories for years when coaches maintain that success and are there forever. That is amazing. A 62-year-old man and a, well, 16-year-old kid can both say they have the same high school football coach right now. That's amazing. <laughs> Some kid and his grandfather can say that. By the way, Wichita East, we were just talking about them. They were down early 6 to nothing against Heights. They had completed a 54-yard bomb and have gone up 8-6 to six of a two-point conversion. So Wichita East on the board. Looks like they got maybe a pretty exciting offense going there. And you mentioned Bryce Brown, their offensive coordinator. Once again, one of the most highly recruited players ever come out of the state of Kansas. And uh, 
played a little bit in the NFL, and now back at his alma mater in Wichita as the offensive coordinator for the East High Blue Aces. Yeah, probably the, the number one recruited player of all time in Kansas. I don't think we've ever had a number one, and he was number one. I mean, I'm not talking number one running back. He was the number one recruit nationally out of any position. We've certainly had those four stars, those five-star guys, whether it's Graham Mertz or Bubba Starling and guys that have had Alabama offers or, or whatever it may be. And maybe if we had recruiting rankings in some years, there would be some highly ranked players. But we've never had a number one, and he was number one. I believe his brother was like number 16, and they were a year apart and on the same team. So kind of crazy to look. As I got some scores across the state, Cimarron leading Syracuse 8 to nothing. Frontenac leading Burlington. Maybe we can go into that game at some point. Burlington undefeated on the year. That's 14-6. to six. Linden leading Anderson County 21 to nothing. Opie leading Pleasanton 21 to nothing. Fort Scott, who has been quarantined for two weeks and started 2-0, playing tonight on their homecoming. It's 0-0 against Labette County. Parsons up on Baxter, 13-0. May South up on Newton, 14-0. Salina Central up on Arc City, 7-0. And Holton leading Royal Valley, 29-0. Yeah, it's good to see Fort Scott back on the field. And I think May South also was back on the field after not playing last week. And that's a team that really got off to a fantastic start, the Mavericks. May South up 14 to nothing on Newton, as Chet just mentioned. And once again, we're up in Oberlin as it is uh, Hoxie taking on at Oberlin, the Red Devils of Oberlin, Decatur County. A lot of red on your screen for this game. Hoxie in uh, home white jerseys, red pants. As uh, as a zero zero in the first uh, or in the uh, first quarter, or second quarter still, or are we into the second quarter? As well, the touchdown now. <laughs> We've got a touchdown from Oxy as they're in the end zone on the pass play to first score of the game. Yeah, we get a replay here. And wide open there on the uh, far sideline and into the end zone for that touchdown. So Hoxie, the Indians on the board, and they'll go for two. Trying to make an 8 to nothing game against Oberlin Decatur County. As it is week number five, it has gone by fast. It always does, it seems like, every year. The high school football season, a season we weren't sure it was going to begin. It has. We've had a lot of stops and Starts, but uh, we've got a lot of football as well as that, as that two-point conversion is good. Hoxie now up eight to nothing against uh, Oberlin Decatur County, and uh, Frontenac looks like we got game. Frontenac was just talking Burlington about. here. Go ahead, Chet. Yeah, and Frontenac. And Frontenac's one of those teams that, you know, they've played a really weird schedule this year, so we, we can't really judge them on their record. And I'm not saying that because I'm from there. <laughs> well, I'm they saying played that because they played. Yeah, Coweta, Oklahoma, you know, is a 5A program. Uh, they lost to them, and then they played McDonald County, who would nearly be a Class 6A team last week. They had to find a game because Iola was in, in quarantine, and, of course, you know, they, they've lost some teams on their schedule this year. So now they're, they're getting to play in a district game, uh, playing Burlington tonight on that very nice grass field. You see there, I don't know if you've ever been by the – by Burlington before, but they have the old castle-looking stadium built in the 80s. It's really unique and, and really cool there in Burlington. And we're back to uh, Canton Galva, where Little River is trying to get back on the board. Down 16-6 to against the Eagles as uh, Canton Galva, a couple touchdowns, a couple two-point conversions. And back to uh, St. James Academy and Bishop Miege. Again, St. James Academy, the home team, even though it's played on Bishop Miege field. As uh, they're in the uh, dark jerseys, St. James Academy, the Thunder trying to get on the board down 7 to nothing in that game. And Little River with the football clearing out the backfield here and going back to pass and uh, going to keep it himself and uh, driven out of bounds at about the 20-yard line. And with that, we're going to take a break from the action you're watching. Kansas Football Friday presented by Sports in Kansas. We're back with more right after this.
I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be open and back to business. These last few months have been hard on everyone. Here at Lewis Automotive Group, we've always promoted buying local, and now it's more important than ever. As our economy gets up and going, let's protect the people closest to us. Support our local businesses first. Together, we can put all of this behind us quickly while still keeping safety at the forefront. From all of us at Lewis Automotive Group, be smart, be safe, and buy local. <laughs> How do you see the world? Ha! At Shiner's Hospitals for Children, we know that changing how you see things can turn them into... Everyday miracles! Like riding my bike. Breaking boards! Ha! Hugging my mom! Every day, for over 90 years, Shriners Hospitals for Children has been sending love to the rescue, regardless of a family's ability to pay. If you know a child we can help, call or go online now. The innocence of youth. Is there anything any better? But soon they'll be in high school and facing all the same challenges you faced. How to make friends. How to fit in. How to be cool. We want our children to have everything they'll need to live fulfilling and productive lives. Make sure the kids in your family are among the more than 170,000 participants here in Kansas who take part in high school sports or activities. And welcome back everybody to Kansas Football Friday presented by Sports in Kansas. I'm Leon Lebel along with, there he is, Chad Kaplan from Sports in Kansas as it is week number five of high school football across the Sunflower State. And once again, we'll be checking in on live action from all across the state of Kansas as there as we check the four, uh, four games we're looking at right now. And Chet, so far we've got some pretty good games uh, checking in with uh, Bishop Meage, St. James Academy. That's up in your upper right. Uh, lower left, uh, that is um, Hoxie at uh, Oberlin, uh, Decatur County. Hoxie taking an 8 to nothing lead in that game. And then our feature game with Michael Quaid on the camera from Kansas Football Friday. we got Little River at Canton Galvin. Little River threatening to score once again. They are down 16-6, to but this looks like we're going to have a pretty good battle here. Connor Kane. Yeah, and you have uh, several of the top football players in eight-man one and all of eight-man in this game that we talked about. I mean, quarterback Graham Stevens, number three, as you see, Jaden Garrison there, and then too many to count on Canton Galvoff, that eight-man one state champion, but of course led by Tyson Struber, Braden Collins, and a lot of physical football here, as you can see from the line play. Very good defenses on both of these teams, and a good game so far, because some of these games sometimes can get out of hand. Of course, uh, we're there with, with a touchdown, Jaden Garrison, a very athletic player. Basketball is his sport, but also a very good football player. That was a nice sort of run off the pitch play to the right side, but how about the blocking there from Little River? Great blocking out front, and they get the touchdown to make it a 16-12 to game. They'll go for two here to try to cut the lead to two, but uh, Canton Galva hanging on to the lead but just gave up the touchdown uh, to Little River as it is 16-12. to Little River going for the two-point conversion. Looks like they get uh, the receivers spread out to the right side, and that's the way they're going to go as they throw underneath, though, and uh, not there. Good defense from Canton Galva to stop another two-point conversion. That's the difference in this game as uh, Canton Galva converted both times on its two-point tries, and they're up 16-12, to Little River. A couple touchdowns, but no extra points. You know, if I'm a small-town football coach, Leon, and, and I've dealt with this before and I've talked about this before, uh, my senior year, we had a lot of games that we lost 14 to 13, 13 to 12. Yeah. I'm maybe one of those coaches in small town America where you can't find a kicker every year that maybe I just go for two every time. And uh, well, let's see, where are we checking in with right now, Mike? Oh, Frontenac. Frontenac in uh, Burlington, Burlington here. And, of course, Colin McCartney at the quarterback position for Frontenac. And he was a kid that was quarantined the first couple of weeks as well. Number five, as you see there. And number 11 on your screen is Landon Dean, who has four FBS offers uh, for the Frontenac Raiders. He's 6'4 6'5", 230 pounds. Both those kids juniors. So Frontenac's got some pieces back the last uh, few weeks and, of course, got a victory over Colgan. But, you know, had to play a school with 1,100 students, and they got 260 uh, so a little bit of difference uh, as far as size and maybe speed and uh, depth from playing a, a week ago. So this is a, an outstanding district game here. Burlington, of course, uh, I believe unbeaten on the year and, and knocked off Lee Seen Prairie View uh, last week. This game being played uh, at Burlington and their 
Very unique Castle Stadium. And back to Oberlin we go as it is Oberlin Decatur County against Hoxie. And we've got an interception in the end zone. Big play there, and that's the second time we've seen an interception in the end zone in, in this game. As Hoxie trying to get it in, here's the replay. Rolling out to his right and kind of just threw it up for grabs and the double coverage, and uh, the Red Devils come up a big, big interception in the end zone. Twice they've done that tonight. Again, Leon Lebo along with Chet Kaplan. And, uh, Chet, uh, you, again, I, as I mentioned, you're fresh off a, another trip out to, out west, southwest Kansas, for your social media tour where you uh, talk to uh, high school students about the uh, what to do with uh, social media, I guess. But uh, you had another great trip, I understand, all over the yeah, place. Yeah, I did. I got a lot of hotel points this week and uh, – <laughs> In a lot of uh, a lot of different towns, a lot of miles on my car. I, in fact, got back uh, to Wichita at about uh, six thirty to, to jump on air here about six forty, and I've been gone since uh, last Sunday. And I'll be at the K State football game tomorrow, and then Monday I'll be back on the road again as I go back uh, to Buckland, Kansas. So I'm all over the place this week. I was in Bird City, St. Francis, Lake and Moscow, Spearville, Cimarron, Weskin, Leota, Wichita County, Tribune, Greeley County. And South Gray, I maybe missed one uh, there, but uh, in a lot of places this week. And you know what? The people are great out in western Kansas. I'm from the southeast corner of the state and uh, didn't spend a lot of time there ever really for anything. Uh, and, and recently I've been out there a lot, whether that's stadium tours, whether that's events to work. And, yeah, we do the power of, of social media tour that basically talks about online reputation, cyberbullying, uh, things like that, viral posting, what to post, what not to post, how to interact online. Really nothing to do with sports, but, uh, of course, great discussion. And, you know, these kids now, they live on their smartphones. They're, they're of course, iPads, all that stuff. Heck, my, my senior year, Leon, text messaging came out. So that's how far we came. Wow. I'm not even going to talk about my senior year, what we did. <laughs> <laughs> Fast notes, yeah. <laughs> Try to sneak them to the, you know, across the, the aisle and the desk. That's about, that's about all. By the way, when you're reading off all those names, you sound like it sounds like a Johnny Cash song. You've been everywhere, man. And continue. <laughs> continue and, those and trips. And the thing that I'm impressed, I'm impressed with, with a lot of these towns. Like I was in St. Francis for several hours until I, I spoke the other day, and I was walking around their downtown and had a coffee at their new coffee shop down there. And if you're in that town, you would think it's a 3A town. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. And then you go to the high school, they may only have 60 or 70 students. So some of these towns may not have large enrollments and may pull from several communities, but the towns are pretty good size. And you could probably speak more on that than me. And I think some of those towns were probably at one point a lot bigger than what they are now. Hoxie uh, taking the punt, and nice return down inside the 20-yard line. You're kind of like me, Chet. You you measure towns by the class. <laughs> it, it looked like a 3A town, you know, or a 4A town. Uh, and when you follow sports, I guess that's how we do it instead of uh, population <laughs> numbers. But, uh, yeah, you're right. As, uh, once again, we're back at Canton Galva. The Eagles up 16-12 to against Little River. This is a great eight-man Division I matchup. And Canton Galva going deep down the middle and just overthrown a bit and incomplete. And I'll bring up fourth down for Canton Galva. So it looks like Little River will get the ball back. Hoxie, meanwhile, trying to get into the end zone once again. At Oberland, as uh, Hoxie up eight to nothing in this game, it's second quarter, six uh, minutes left, clock running. Once again, you're watching Kansas Football Friday, presented by Sports in Kansas. Leon Lebo, along with the man who created Sports in Kansas, Chet Couplin. You're going to the K State game tomorrow. We had Taylor Bratt, the recruiting coordinator, on as our special guest a week ago, and he was down in Norman, Oklahoma, for that interview. Wow. I think we had something to do with that, a little karma there as K-State came up with a huge, not just the upset, but the fact that they came from behind down 28-7 to uh, to knock off number three, Oklahoma. What a terrific game that was to watch. Yeah, incredible. And, and you know, Taylor got onto this broadcast because he supports Kansas high school football so much and, and really speaks on it and talks about it. And, you know, that's how we've developed that relationship because I'm very biased, I'll admit it, to the Kansas high school football recruit. I want to see him do good. I want to see him get recruited. And, 
And last week we see them go down to Norman when nobody's giving them a chance. I'm thinking it's going to be a blowout. It's, of course, 35 to 14 in that game late in the third quarter, and Kansas State makes a miraculous comeback. And not only that, you know, Blake Lynch, Goddard Eisenhower, kicks a 50-yard field goal. He's a walk-on to the program. Uh, Jer- Jerron McPherson gets the interception to seal the deal. He's a Baser Linwood kid. And, of course, 12 of the starters that started on Saturday were former Kansas high school football players. And 24 of the players that played for the Wildcats and beat number three Oklahoma and Norman are former Kansas high school football players, 12 of those being walk-ons. So if you wonder why kids sometimes take that PWO, and what I mean by PWO, it means preferred walk-on. If you wonder why sometimes kids take that over maybe a Division II scholarship, that's why. It was a terrific game, and of course, K-State is at home again tomorrow, back home tomorrow against Texas Tech. I think that's a 2.30 kickoff at Bill Snyder Family Stadium. As uh, once again, we're uh, back to action in uh, at Canton Gallup, uh, Little River with the football. Uh, a little while ago, we just saw Hoxie score again as they'll be going for two against Oberlin Decatur County at Little River. With the uh, pass play and nothing going there, Canton Gallup with some good defense. Meanwhile, down, uh, I can tell you, Hoxie did not get that two-point conversion. I'm looking at the, the monitor on my screen, and uh, so it will remain 14 to nothing, uh, Hoxie over Oberlin. But once again, it is, we're watching Little River at Canton Galva. Canton Galva ranked number one in eight-man division one, undefeated at 4-0. and Little River, though, no slouch at 3-1. and they got the football, second down. As uh, The only difference in this game is two missed extra point attempts by Little River going for a two-point conversion twice. They failed to get in the end zone, while Canton Galva got both of its uh, two-point conversions. They were successful, and that's why it's 16 to 12. And that's why it's so hard to, to key on this Little River team. As you've seen, we've seen a lot of number three Graham Stevens tonight at the quarterback position. Well, now you look in the backfield, it's number 10, Jaden Garrison. I spoke on that earlier. When you have two quarterbacks in that backfield, or really two running backs, they can play either. Probably either one of them can play receiver as well. You just never know where the ball is going. We know that it's going in one of their hands, but very hard to judge as you see Jaden Garrison coming up at the quarterback position. And here they are with three uh, receivers to the near side, going to roll out to his right, going deep down the right sideline, the near sideline, and overthrows his receiver. So it'll bring up third down for Little River as uh, once again we are watching games uh, all across the state of Kansas. We Up in Johnson County on your upper right, that's Bishop Miege and St. James Academy. And Bishop Miege has now taken a 14 to nothing lead in this game. Once again, it's a home game for St. James Academy but they play their home games at Bishop Miege. So they're on the Miege home uh, field there in the uh, Kansas City uh, area. Bishop Miege in the uh, white uniforms of the red uh, pants and uh, St. James Academy in the home dark uniforms, the white helmets. By the way, it would be remiss to not mention uh, today is an important anniversary in the history of sports in the state of Kansas, a, a sad anniversary, but it is the 50th anniversary of the plane crash of Wichita State football team in 1970 that killed 31 people, including 14 players on that team. And I know they had a, a large memorial service today at Cessna Stadium in uh, Wichita. As uh, we watch, St. James Academy has just got on the board with that long touchdown. And so it makes it a 14 to six game. Bishop Miege with the lead. Big touchdown there for St. James. And you, you speak of that, uh, Leon, about uh, what happened there at Mount Trelease back on October 2nd, 1970 in that plane crash. And that's something I've always read a lot about and have been fascinated with over the years, of course, being a Wichita State alum and uh, being a history person and of course, you know, sports in Kansas and all the facts and stuff that uh, I like to talk with, with people like you. Um, I actually did that hike last year in uh, the summer of 2019 and all that wreckage and everything's still up there. We, we posted some photos, but, you know, warning, uh, it, it does contain some graphic content that may be sensitive if you don't want to look at it. But, you know, we did that uh, really to remember those people and uh, the memorial and all that off of I-70. Um, and it's quite remarkable uh, to see that. And it was a surreal experience. It, uh, it really gave me chills 
uh, going up and doing that. It was one of the hardest hikes I've ever done in no way, shape, or form. I'm not an experienced hiker, but uh, just right off you know, by the Eisenhower Tunnel there when they were building that, that was actually some of the rescuers uh, that day that were, were building on that tunnel that day and when they saw the plane go down. And I've watched documentaries, different things like that on that. And, of course, they were going to Logan, Utah and refueled there at the – Stapleton Airport, I believe, in uh, Denver, and two planes, uh, one that had juniors and seniors, some booster and administrators, and then, of course, uh, underclassmen plane as well. One went down. Of course, one took the other path. The, the plane that went down took the scenic path, so I've always been uh, fascinated by it, and, I, you know, my heart breaks for those families that were affected by it. You know, I was born 14 years after that even happened, and hearing about it and seeing the memorial at Wichita State and all that, I had to do that hike, and I can tell you, I had goosebumps, hair on my, you know, arms standing up on that, and it was uh, just a remarkable, surreal uh, experience because all that stuff is just like walking back in time, like it was left there. So, I uh, definitely want to remember those that lost their life 50 years ago today. And even though it happened 50 years ago, it is remarkable that so many people memorialize uh, that event and remember those people and honor those uh, survivors and the families who, who lost their uh, loved ones and uh, every year they come back to Wichita and today was a very large memorial again they held it at Cessna Stadium because of the 50th anniversary a lot more people there but uh, again one of the um, sad anniversaries um, significant anniversaries in the history of sports in Kansas meanwhile we, we just saw Canton Galva uh, take a, score another touchdown and go up. Uh, they got the extra point, I believe, so it makes it 24 to 12 over a little river. One more thing about that Wichita State story, of course, three weeks later, they were back on the football field. They call it the second season. The NCAA allowed the freshmen to play. Of course, back then, freshmen were not eligible. Their first game was at Arkansas. They played that game in Little Rock, Arkansas. ESPN, if you have a chance, has a story on that on their website. And it is fascinating, terrific view, video of that game. And it, it shows the Shockers coming out of the field and the Arkansas fans giving them a standing ovation. And there's some great interviews and their players from that game. And they talked about no matter what they did, every time they did something in that game, the Arkansas fans cheered. They stayed for the entire game. They gave them a standing ovation at halftime after the game was over. Arkansas won 62 to nothing. They, they left their starters in for only, I think, the first couple possessions. I mean, Shockers were obviously overmatched, uh, undermanned, and, and whatnot. But it was a, it's a terrific story if you get a chance. Again, it's on ESPN.com. Yeah, and I remember seeing that picture that you're talking about, uh, specifically of, of uh, you know the next game uh, coming out. And the captains with John Hoheisel coming out on crutches, mm -hmm. who I believe is from Garden Plain, Kansas. His son ended up playing at uh, Kansas State. And uh, it's just it's crazy to, to hear some of the stories uh, that you've seen of the survivors, things like that. And there's some documentaries on, on YouTube, some articles on Wichita Eagle. And uh, it's just it's such a sad deal, but uh, it's awesome that they're still being remembered. And I believe that same year, which, of course, there's a movie about it, We Are Marshall, Mm -hmm. I believe that happened in the same exact year in 1970. Yeah, I believe, I'm not sure, one happened just about a few months before the other. I can't remember the order of, uh, of tragedies there, but yeah, that was a, obviously a tough year for college football. But uh, you talk about uh, John Holeisel, the, uh, the captain, going out there in midfield with the crutches. There's an interview of an Arkansas player in that uh, story ESPN did. And that player said, I could not take my eyes off of him when I saw him come out on the, on the crutches. It was very emotional for, uh, for both teams, obviously. So it's really good. Uh, it's really interesting to watch. As we're back to action here, Little River going deep, and that ball is picked off. Canton Galva coming up with the interception down near the 25-yard line as Little River trying to get back into this uh, down 24 to 12. The long pass down the field, but the... Uh, Eagles come up with the interception. And guess who? The eight-man one defensive player <laughs> of the year who's got a Kansas State and KU offer. And, of course, junior Tyson Struber, the superstar on that team on both sides of the football. You know, I've seen Little River twice go to a guy that Struber's on. He's six foot three, 190 pounds, and the fastest guy in the field. i definitely steer away from him. I would not be surprised here in your top of your screen, right, that they go to Struber for the score here with Maltby at the quarterback position to put them up by a couple scores. And once again, Cannon Galva back with the football and leading 24 to 12. 
Three touchdowns, three two-point conversions for the Eagles. Saint uh, or a Little River with a couple touchdowns, but no extra points in this game. As back to Hoxie at Oberlin, and looks like Hoxie just or Oberlin just scored the touchdown. The Red Devils, the hometown team. Or was that? Yeah, I think that was called. The whistle might have blown on that, but Hoxie up 14 to nothing in this game. So they had a uh, touchdown and a two-point conversion. Their second touchdown, they were kept out of the uh, end zone on the two-point conversion attempt. As here's a replay, and uh, I think we had a flag on the play and a penalty against Oberlin. So they will mark that off, and we'll do it again as we go back to Canton Galva. And as soon as we get there, the whistles are blowing, and we got a timeout on the field as the Eagles with the ball. They call a timeout. And I think we're going to have Connor Nickel, of course, who's out uh, in Colby, Kansas, who I was out there this week. But Colby's 4-0 this season quietly. They've had a, a pretty good program the last couple of years under Reese McKinney. And they got a game tonight versus Southeast of Saline, who's also 4-0. He's at that game tonight uh, in Colby, of course, Southeast of Saline, led by head coach Mitch Gibhart, his son, the star player. Uh, so they're a team, of course, that has had three shutouts in a row. Uh, and they're taking on Colby on the road tonight in a little bit of a road trip. Uh, there for a district game, so hopefully we'll, we'll catch up with Connor Nickel to talk about that Class 3A district matchup. Hey, another team we've been talking about a little bit is Hutchinson Salthawks off to a four and a start for the first time since 2009, and they lead Andover in the second quarter seven to nothing. So Hutch Salthawks, after a couple losing seasons, back on the winning track this year. Dodd City leading Great Bend 21-7. Dodd City, a team we've uh, watched a few times here on Kansas Football Friday the last few weeks. That's a battle in the WAC Conference out west. And Hoisington leading Minneapolis 7-6 at halftime. Hoisington, a team we've talked a lot about. Yeah, that's a little bit of a surprise. I know Minneapolis isn't bad and has a pretty good tight end uh, receiver on that team, a good offensive lineman as well. But uh, they've kind of started slow in some games this year and, of course, uh, a ground and pound team this year. So we'll see what happens in that one. i got some more updates for you across the state from scores in Kansas in the second quarter. Rock Creek leading Sabetha 16-8. to uh, Parsons leading Baxter 21 to nothing. Phillipsburg up on Beloit 30 to 6. Andell up 32 to 7 on a very good Heston team. Central Heights beating Horton 42 to nothing. Mays up on Salina South 42 to 13. Topeka High up 20 to 6 on Highland Park. Linden up on Anderson County 34 to nothing. Holton up on Royal Valley 44 0. Cheney up 21 to nothing on Pratt. Columbus leading Cherryville 14 to nothing. Emporia and Washburn Rural locked at 14. Uniontown leading Northern Heights 21 to nothing. Wichita East 8. Wichita Heights 6. Mulvane 18. Coffeeville 7. And uh, Hillsboro 6. Haven 0. And the Wichita East team, going back to them, if I got this right, their first two games, they scored a total of 134 points and only eight points tonight, leading 8-6 to six against Wichita Heights. They won 80 to nothing, I believe, that was their first game of the year against Wichita North. And then uh, was it 54 to nothing last week against Wichita South? So, but 8-6 to six yeah, tonight. Been one of the more, more surprising teams, of course, uh, Wichita City League, of course, this year they're not playing any of the, the regular normal schedule like they would have because they didn't even know if they were going to have a season. And then they've played Wichita North, played Wichita South. So schedules probably helped them uh, to an extent. Uh, and it's certainly, of course, going to get a little bit tougher. As I mentioned, they're playing Heights. And then in a couple of weeks, they're not going to do that to Wichita Northwest. If they do, it'll be a shootout because we have seen uh, Northwest and some of those in Northwest Really one of the top programs uh, in the state after back-to-back -back runner up finishes uh, since they moved down to that Class 5A. So it's also nice to see on our screen that we've seen uh, Mill Valley bounce back this week. You know, Free State, of course, they lost their best player to Tong and Oxy. So they've struggled a little bit out of the gate so far this year and played an out-of-state opponent. Uh, but, you know, despite Mill Valley has two losses to Bentonville, Arkansas, then a brand new quarterback last week and an upset against Gardner Edgerton. As I mentioned, I still have them in my top 10 and in my top five. I think Mill Valley is still a more than capable program, and you're seeing that in your top left screen there, 28 to nothing. 
28 to nothing, Mill Valley with that lead as we're also we're watching. There it is. Uh, Hoxie on the move of a long run down to the 30 yard line of Oberlin Decatur County. Now going to the end zone, and that ball are going to uh, the 10 yard line, and that was incomplete. Back to Canton Galva, Little River at the football, trying to bring it here on the near side, a little sweep, and not much there as uh, Canton Galva leading that game 24 to 12 over Little River. And the scary thing about Canton Galva is, is they can score so fast. Uh, just whenever you think you're right there with them, you know, I, I watched them last year, and, and that was the craziest game I've ever seen in my life at any level. They were down 36 to nothing in the second quarter and scored 66 unanswered. I mean, you just don't hear of that, and you specifically don't hear of that in a state championship game. Uh, and that's what they did. I mean, it's a 45-point rule, and... St. Francis wasn't far away from pointing them, and all of a sudden they came back and scored 66 uh, in a row with Graham Stevens on the carry there for Little River. But so impressive uh, what they did a year ago. They graduated some of those guys, but a lot of these key pieces uh, are back for this team. So Canton Galva, very, very good uh, and scary eight-man program. They got a lot of kids on that team that a lot of players, a lot of teams would like to have. I know McPherson's close there, and they're a very good Class 4A program playing DeSoto tonight. Uh, at Washburn Rural, and I know McPherson probably would like to have a few of Canton Galva's players only about, what, 15 minutes away. St. James Academy of Bishop Mies we just saw there, and St. James Academy of a terrific opportunity. They had the man wide open. He could not hold on to the pass, and so they'll walk it back, and uh, once again, we have them in the upper right, upper left, uh, Mill Valley and Free State. Mill Valley leading 28 to nothing. Once again, Mill Valley lost last week to Gardner Edgerton. Gardner Edgerton trailing at halftime. Olathe North leading the Blazers 21 to 7. As uh, back to uh, Oberlin, we've got an interception. Hoxie coming up with the ball. The interception and the flag flying afterwards. Let's see what the call is going to be, but that's another interception for Hoxie. That's the third pick in this game. As we watch the replay here. Well, play action, throw on that far sideline, and uh, just kind of jumped the route and came up with the interception. Nice defense there from Oxy, and there comes your flag flying in well after the play, and it looks like that. See if the interception stands, or is that penalty against Hoxie? And back to Bishop Miege against St. James Academy, and they're going to do a little quick kick here on fourth down and 13. That ball is going to roll. Oh, they downed it at the one-yard line, it looks like. Nice to special teams from St. James Academy. That ball took a nice little roll there. It just kind of died at the one-yard line, and they were able to down it. As we go back to Little River, the Redskins on the run. Here's Little River into the end zone for the touchdown. Little River hanging in there against Canton Galva. That's going to make it 24-18. Graham Stevens on the carry there. Of course, kind of the utility player. He was injured a little bit uh, last year, but a uh, very good player uh, out of the backfield. Very powerful back with a little bit of speed to him uh, as well to cut this down to a one-score lead. And he's got a pretty good arm, as we've seen. Not, hasn't completed a lot of passes, but they've gone downfield a couple times, and I think they're going to try to continue to do that and maybe hit one big here. But they got the long touchdown run that time, Graham, Ste Graham Stevens. And now they'll try the two-point conversion. They are 0 for 2 on two-point tries tonight. Here they go, and the pitch out to the right side, and just not there. Wow. So it'll remain 24 to 18, Canton Galva on top. Little River cannot uh, convert the two-point conversions tonight. This game would be tied. Got some. Yeah, I mean, two-point conversions, you see a lot of schools. I just did my math in my head schools. there, Chet. And <laughs> <laughs> two times two times three is six and they're down by six so got some second quarter scores and halftime scores for you across the state and and this is pretty impressive i know pittsburgh's a little bit down this year but how how improved is capen this year leon i mean they fought with bishop carroll they're leading pittsburgh at the striker sports complex tonight in the second quarter 34 to nothing mm. in that game i think capen is uh, much improved this year mays Leading Salina South, 49-13. Some halftime scores are Smith Center, 21. Oakley, 7. May South, 21. Newton, 7. 
Boisington 7, Minneapolis 6, Goodland and Smoky Valley locked at 6, Mar Hill, Mount Academy 33, Atchison Community 0, Stafford 28, Caldwell 6, Pike Valley 8, St. John's Tipton 8, Paola leading Wamigo 34 to nothing. That Paola team very good as we saw them with Garrett Williams and company on here and holding off that very good Tonga Noxie team a few weeks here. Uh, so some pretty good teams overall in 4A. We still think the team on your screen right now is your favorite in the white and Bishop Miege, but there's that Paola, there's that Toganoxie. Who will be that team out west? Will that be McPherson this year? Uh, can that be Andover Central, who got there last year? It's been all Bishop Miege for six years, and it's not been close in any way, shape, or form. Will 2020 be the year that somebody sneaks up on the Stags? Hey, back to Capen, Capen Mount Carmel, the Crusaders, looking impressive. Of course, under first-year head coach Weston Schartz, a long-time coach in the Wichita City League at Wichita West, and then went over to Wichita Northwest for a while, back to West, and, and now finishing out his career probably at uh, Capen. And it looks like he does have the Crusaders playing pretty well as uh, they've only lost the, the one game, and that was uh, against Bishop Carroll when they had a chance. They had a chance to win that game and fumbled on their final possession to end the game. But uh, you know, Weston Schartz has Capen looking pretty good, and uh, – they might be an interesting 5A story in the in the city league if they'll uh, end up having to go through Wichita Northwest, of course. But uh, keep an eye on Capen. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of teams in Class 5A that I think we certainly have to keep an eye on. I mean, out of the WAC conference, not a lot of people are talking about, but the Hayes High Indians are a team right now that's 4-0, I think, for the first time in you know, about six years. Uh, they're open this week. They play against Dodge City next week. They're at May South, and then they play Capen this year as well on their schedule. So Hayes and Capen both looking to kind of be those breakaway teams, and all of a sudden we have some teams, Leon, as you mentioned. Nobody put Capen in the conversation on 5A West. Well, now you have to. May South is in that conversation. Goddard's in that conversation. Wichita Heights is. Wichita Northwest. Mays, Hayes in that conver conversation. And another team that you just talked about, moments ago that nobody i can guarantee you nobody had in the conversation on 5a west is the salt hawks of hutch who moved down mm -hmm. from class 6a to 5a so all of a sudden you got well over a handful six seven eight teams on 5a west that are contenders to get there now wichita northwest is your favorite hands down out of everybody but bishop carroll is still sitting there as well and then when we get on the east side you have of course aquinas you have mill valley you have teams like that i think it's going to go through those two teams but right now, that 5A West, pretty deep. It does look uh, very competitive in the 5A West side of the bracket. And it should be interesting as this season uh, continues. And, uh, again, we've had a lot of, uh, I don't know if surprises is the right word, but this season so different and different scheduling and different opponents, uh, it has been hard maybe uh, to forecast who's going to be there at the end. But uh, it, it does look like a competitive uh, situation for Class 5A, no doubt about that. Yeah, it's, it's one of those years where it's so hard to judge where a team's at because then you figured out, well, we had seven players in quarantine. Well, Kansas State's defense last week had seven players out and had twos and threes and walk-ons out there, and they go and beat the Oklahoma Sooners, and they had more players out than Oklahoma. So you don't even know until game time sometimes. The kids pulled out of class at 3 o'clock and said, hey, you got to go home for 14 days. You can't play for the next two weeks. We've been dealing with that all season to know – really who's who as i mentioned it is kind of like the wild west out there and really like a video game like a create a schedule mode on a, on a video game for football that that's kind of what it's been like this year some of the games that we've seen we never thought we would have ever seen some of these teams match up now i'm guilty of saying some of it's kind of cool now not if you're an athletic director or or a coach and trying to plan for these things but some of the matchups we've seen this year i think are pretty awesome because we would have never seen them they are. And getting back to talking about the, the pandemic in college football, I heard something interesting from uh, Chris Kleiman, the head coach at K-State this week. He said he thought the advantage to, they had in the, the second half in the fourth quarter against Oklahoma was they weren't tired. He said, because we have played so many guys at practice because we don't know who's healthy or who's ready to play or not. And he said, we give all these guys these reps. And I think they played uh, almost – almost except a handful of guys played in that game. And so they've created uh, an incredible amount of depth just by necessity. And uh, he said we were in better shape because we had more guys. And that makes perfect sense because when we had Taylor Brad on this show, I asked him that question about Hayden Gillum of Plainville. I go, 
How good of a situation is this for a guy that's a two or three? A guy from Plainville, Kansas that's a walk-on that may never play, but he's getting to play because you have guys in quarantine. Well, now all of a sudden, as I mentioned, you got guys that probably would have never been on a depth chart, never would have played, and I made the joke to Taylor on this show last week that this may be the largest year for college football lettermen of all time because we're going to play so many players. Well, as you mentioned, Leon, there's a lot of those players that have to get those reps in practice, and I think it showed in week one because a lot of those guys weren't used to get reps in practice with maybe some of those ones, as you see. But now, after a couple of weeks and a week off and a game under their belt, Things have changed, and all of a sudden, some of those guys have a little bit of experience. Hey, we have a special guest, as always. Uh, we're going to check in with Connor Nickel out to West. And, Connor, there you are. Where are you at tonight, man? Uh, certainly. Hey, fellas, I am in, in Colby tune tonight. A pair of very, very good Class 3A teams. Actually, uh, stats-wise, the number one and number two scoring defenses in Class 3A, Colby 4-0 and Southeast of, of Missalene, also 4 and no We're at half right now. It is 16 to nothing. Southeast leads, uh, leads Colby. Uh, Jackson Gebhardt has played very, very well. But, but with the top player for Southeast on defense, uh, Matthew Rodriguez, obviously he led the team in tackles as a sophomore, has led, led th this season too. Uh, he's, got, he's got two tackles for loss and a huge TFL and forced fumble at the Colby four-yard uh, line that then scored it into the, the um, end zone. Southeast fell on it for a um, score. He has played extremely well. Well on defense, um, Hagen Bowie, the standout Colby Colby fullback. No run. All of his carries have been under 10 yards. So Southeast has done a really nice job on defense. Ryan Myers has thrown the ball very very well. Uh, but Gephardt, of course, the uh, three-year starter starter quarterback, coach's son. Uh, he has had a very very nice nice uh, first half. We expected a very low scoring game. I told a guy who I know pregame. I said. This may be first one to 20, uh, and here we are at half. It is 16 Southeast, Colby with none. Well, of course, uh, they moved up to Class 3A this year from, you know, up to Class 3A. Uh, do you feel like Southeast of Saline, of course, in, in a very tested district and a big game, do you feel like they have a shot to, to make a little bit of noise in these uh, Class 3A playoffs? <laughs> Yeah, and that was, I mean, that was a huge question coming in is the last several years when Southeast has not played in their league, they have by and large struggled. Um, I mean, there have been several years where they've gone five and zero or so in league, and two and three outside of league, and losing early, early in the in the playoffs. Uh, Coach Gephardt has been here for a long time. He's gone consistently seven. In fact, I think he had four consecutive seven and three years, um, and they of course had. Uh, uh, back to back eight eight and two and two years so he's had some very good teams uh, but this this program has not won more than eight games in a season in 14 years uh, so they've had a lot of early uh, playoff round um, closures falling early in the in the postseason I really wanted to see how they would match up against a, vi a very physical defensive minded Colby team so far they have done a very good job the uh, the two Two, two takeaways. So Gephardt and Bryant Banks were just under 1,000 yards rushing last year. Southeast returned over 90% of their, of their ground game. Bryant Banks is huge. I mean, he is enormous as a, a, a fullback. Southeast has got a lot of really good, good size. Um, and they've been able to be dy dynamic again in their in their league. So a huge question was how could they play on the road in a in a in a non-league game? And so far they have played strongly. Hey Connor, I want to go back to a week ago when we were uh, checking in on Leota, Wichita County at Hodgman County. That's a game you covered. We were going to talk to you, but it, it, got, it was over at halftime. Uh, we thought it was going to be a lot more competitive than that. How impressed were you with uh, Leota? 
I know, incredibly, incredibly impressed. I saw Leota play two years ago when uh, they had just started out. Coach Douglas, it was his first year there. Um, he had he's from Wyoming. He's coached in Texas and a few of a few other states. Um, and they started two and zero that that year. It was the first two and zero start for Leota in ten plus seasons. They won six games that year. Of course, 10 wins last year. Returned basically everybody. They have four four-year starters. They have a three-year starter at quarterback who might be the best eight-man quarterback. Then, of course, they have the, um, the transfer, Manny Chavez, uh, transferred back in he went to tribune which is about 30 miles away for for several years one of the few two-way starters and i and i've told people this and chet and i have even talked talked talk about this the gap between wc and canton galva is very very small I want to stress those are both outstanding, outstanding teams. And obviously, Canton Galva uh, getting a strong test to tonight. But what Leota does so well, 35 players on their, on their roster. I believe it is 15 seniors. Coach Douglas uh, does an outstanding job. Wins over Hodgman County. Wins over Hoxie so far. Uh, scoring a ton of points again, they have to be your significant West favorite right now. Connor, whenever we look at uh, Class 5A football on the West, I know that you're very familiar living in Hayes with the Hayes High program, and they've been very impressive this year to 4 0 start. They're not playing tonight. Of course, four guys, three guys with football, another guy going to Tennessee. And maybe more than that in the long run, maybe if Trey Adams picks up an offer, but how deep is 5A West football this year? I mean, I wish this was a year that maybe Hayes was on the 4A West. Now they're bumped up to 5A, and you got Wichita Northwest. You got Capen putting it on people this year, Bishop Carroll, and I've not even gotten into several other teams. How good is 5A West football? Well, uh, Chad, as you mentioned right before, before coming on, Hutch obviously um, has really, really improved. I talked with Coach Mike Vernon at Hutch uh, this week, and it was amazing talking to him because, of course, he was a longtime assistant with Coach and Coach Dryling. Uh, he already had ni nice, nice turnarounds, rounds of two, two previous schools, and just the uh, confidence in his voice, knowing that he knows what it takes. For Hutch High to win again, he talked about some of their uh, linemen, you know, two and three year starters being really, really quality, quality players. Obviously, they're uh, back. They're they're they're. they're back in the backfield has played really, really well. You know, I really felt, and I, I wrote this 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 in preseason, that Kyler Semrad for Goddard was the single most indispensable player on any team in Kansas. Um, and that is really borne out to be to be true. I believe last year when he was healthy in a game, Goddard averaged 30 points a game. When he was not in the game or hurt, uh, they averaged 12. And obviously him him and Shope um, have, have just put together really, really impressive seasons. Obviously, there are some questions with uh, Northwest, with strength, strength of schedule. But I think in the end, that's all going to work itself out to a certain extent. I think Heights is pretty decent. The Sanders kid transferring to Mays really hurt them. Obviously, East and Northwest should be for that for that conference's title. Uh, but yeah, five A is really really deep. Um, and you know, Great Ben right now is of course 0, 0 and three and has not won won a game. And just talking and knowing people associated with that with that program, Great Ben's like. We're in 4A, <laughs> you know. We could, <laughs> we could win a playoff game or two here. And I know that, um, you know, they were supposed to play Capen in Week Four, and they felt like not playing Capen was a positive for them. And obviously, Capen is on paper the third to sixth best team in 5A West, and Capen is a very good team. So it just goes, it goes to show 5A West is really, really deep. Visiting with Connor Nickel and on your screen right now, St. James Academy and Bishop Yeh now tied 14 to 14, 24 seconds left in the first half. Connor, I just have one final question for you. It has nothing to do with high school football. What's the deal with the Oregon Duck gear? I certainly, <laughs> I, I get, I get asked about that, about that a lot. 
um, and this is going to be kind of a blast from the, from the past. Um, when I was, Chet, I believe you and I are a year apart age age wise. I, I am an, an 03 grad, but Oregon had Joey Harrington <laughs> when I was in, in um, high school. Obviously, he finished third in the, in the Heisman Trophy race, uh, and I was a high school kid, thought he was really cool, not only from what he did, did on the field, but off but off the field field as well as well too. Um, and then they had Luke Ridenauer and Luke Jackson, uh, two three-point shooting uh, specialists uh, wow. in that 02 to 04 <laughs> range. And then of course they got you know, Chip Chip Kelly. Um, and uh, and so in fact. Uh, there are still photos of me when I moved here 13 years ago, wearing a duck hat back then. So I've always. And then last <laughs> last note, when 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 the Ducks played at Wyoming two years ago, Josh Allen, of course, was the quarterback for Wyoming. I drove eight and a half hours and saw them play. It was a really fun game. So I've been a been a Duck fan for a long, long time. All right, Connor. Thank you so much for that explanation. Chet, do you have any more for Connor? Well, Connor, we appreciate uh, your hard work. We'll be looking for your recap uh, tomorrow and uh, have fun being the only Duck fan in Colby, Kansas tonight, man. Yes, sir. Fellas, as always, appreciate it. You guys have a great night. <laughs> All right. Maybe Phil Knight can send you some gear free, maybe, <laughs> if you get that fixed up for you. Thanks, Connor. We're going to take a break as it is halftime across uh, Kansas, a lot of our games, and we're going to take a little halftime intermission. You're watching Kansas Football Friday presented by Sports in Kansas. We're back with more after this. It's okay to shop around, but make your last stop Lewis Chevrolet of Garden City. We have the largest pre-owned inventory in western Kansas, and we back them with GM certification. That means you get an upgraded ride and peace of mind with a 172-point inspection, three months of OnStar and XM Radio, two years of no-cost maintenance, and a six-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. Plus, at Lewis Chevrolet of Garden City, you never pay retail. Stop by Lewis Chevrolet of Garden City today or click lewischevy.com. Buy local. Buy for less. Buy Lewis. So, what is love? Love is being independent. Love is dancing. A Shriners Hospital for Children. Love is a new smile. At Shriners Hospitals for Children, love is caring for a child regardless of the family's ability to pay. Learn how you can send your love to the rescue at lovetotherescue.org. Rhymes with great? Participate. Where does greatness start? Here, in the classroom. On the stage. In the pool. On the field. Where will your greatness take you? To better grades. To more friends. Yeah! Be great. Participate! <laughs> And welcome back to Kansas Football Friday, presented by Sports in Kansas. I'm Leon Lebo, along with Chet Kaplan from Sports in Kansas. As once again, as every Friday night, we check uh, live action across the state of Kansas, live reports, live interviews. You just saw Connor Nickel from out west give us a report from up uh, in Colby. As uh, there's Chet Kaplan checking back with us, as it is uh, halftime at a lot of our games, as we'll be checking on live action. But uh, Chet, so far tonight, some pretty competitive football games we've been looking in on. 
very competitive football games and a lot on the line in some of these football games, Leon. Some of these games are district games. Uh, it's early in the season for some people, even though we're in week five uh, for other people. So uh, certainly a lot of uh, interesting things. I mentioned Cape, and, you know, I think they're one of those breakout teams tonight. I mean, we got some weird games tonight as well. I mean, Hugoton, a team that we saw the crazy drop kick with a few weeks ago way out in southwest Kansas. They're playing Canadian Texas. And I know that sounds crazy to a lot of people listening, but like I said when I was in Elkhart, you're not far from Texas. You're not far from New Mexico. You're not far from Colorado or Oklahoma. So some weird games, of course, uh, going on tonight and uh, some surprising games as well. Uh, looking at Clearwater, I think they're a team that not a lot of people talking about. They're beating Halstead 21-18 to at the half. Of course, Perry LeCompton playing uh, Winfield tonight. That game wasn't supposed to happen, and Perry's 3A, Winfield's 4A. They're winning 20 to 7 to 13 uh, at the half as well. So certainly uh, some interesting games out there across the state of Kansas in uh, some of those games, as I mentioned, pieced together at the last minute. But we appreciate Connor Nickel coming on, and uh, I knew he was a big Oregon Duck fan. I saw that this summer. I didn't know that uh, prior. Uh, but Connor's one of those guys like us. He knows all these random stories everywhere he goes, and more impressive for him that dude's from Missouri, grew up in uh, Missouri and went to school at Truman State. You know, you and I are Kansas guys and talk about our hometowns and have been around it always. But uh, he's a transplant into Hayes and uh, worked a long time for the newspaper there and one of, if not the best sports writers in the state. Yeah, he not only knows what's going on on the field, he, he knows a, a lot of background stories. He knows who's related <laughs> to who. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing. He does a terrific job, Connor Nickel. And, man, does he know his Oregon sports. He, he named after every athlete that's ever gone to Oregon. But he's a true Ducks fan, so uh, we'll give it up to him. But, uh, hey, you know, we got some individual leaders here week number five. Let's check out the passing leaders across the state of Kansas throwing that football. Yeah, and this is coming in, of course, to, to week four. So tonight's stats uh, not on here, but this was uh, coming into, of course, week five after week four. I mean, uh, looking at a lot of these, you know, some of these kids, you know, don't have their full games in. So we got them by average here. But Blake Pogey having a nice year, of course, for Tongan Oxy uh, this year. Charlie Killensworth, you know, that's just in a couple games this year for Rock Creek, who was leading earlier tonight. Dylan Smith, uh, dual threat for Larned, having a big year this year. And Colton McCarty out of Shilin High School, six-man standout. He can do it through the air, do it on the ground. Ty Black and Shawnee Mission Northwest, they play Aquinas this week. Bethany Bowman actually had him on Sports in Kansas All Access. Of course, his dad, Bo Black, the longtime Great Bend coach. And then for a couple years out at Hayes, Andrew Corey in Junction City having a nice year. Nick Hogan into the top ten this week out of Eisenhower. And Isaac Stanton, a first-year starter at Baser Linwood, he certainly uh, put up a lot of numbers uh, across the state uh, this year as well. But a lot of good passers across the state as we go into rushing leaders. Of course, Bowden out of Toganoxie, the transfer Coming over from Free State, a monster year for him. He had 1,096 yards entering tonight. Colton McCarty, as you see there again, the six-man standout. Uh, and, and that's, of course, uh, is, is just big-time numbers for him. And he was our player of the year last year in that division. Tank Young having an outstanding year as well out of St. Thomas Aquinas. And, of course, Shadron Blanca out of St. Francis, uh, candidate for the eight-man one player of the year. Andrew Swin having a huge year for Mar Hill on both sides of the football. And we mentioned Alec McQuan out of Hutchison. He's really been the difference maker for that team as they jump down to Class 5A in that offensive line. He's been one of the players that, honestly, I didn't know anything about coming into the season. And I can't say very many times about that because you know a lot about these kids because they're at the camps, they're at the combines, or they're on the leaderboards from last year. So he's been one of those players that's been – one of the nicest surprises in Kansas so far. As we jump over to receiving, Stephen Witter, of course, Blue Valley Northwest. They, you know, coming into here only had played, uh, of course, one game that he had. Uh, but outside of that, you look at uh, some of these guys having big years. Tanner Barkus out of Parsons this year. Jordan Brown out of Bazer Linwood. Mitchell Busing out of Axtell. Jake Shope, uh, have that wrong. He's actually out of Goddard. Uh, but very good player uh, for him, Marcelo Busey, of course, out of Junction City having a huge year. And that's the hardest thing about doing stat leaderboards this year because we kind of have to do that average because we got mm. one team, one player that's played two games, another player that's played five games, et cetera. Normally in a normal year, we know what we're shooting for. We're shooting for that 1,000 yards or whatever it is. This year, Leon, it might be shooting for 500 yards because you may only get five games. 
Yeah, we've often mentioned tonight it is week number five for Kansas high school football for most teams across the state of Kansas. Some of it's not uh, been the case. Uh, they've had, uh, like Fort Scott, you mentioned, uh, off for two straight weeks. Uh, Capen did not play last week. They're back on the field tonight against Pittsburgh and, and looking good. But, uh, yeah, it's been a crazy year indeed. Hey, our feature game we've been checking in on tonight, an eight-man battle, and it has been a battle tonight, and that's Little River at Canton Galva. There's Canton Galva. It's halftime there, and the moon is out bright on this uh, October evening as uh, Canton Galva leads that game 24-18 to over Little River at the half. And once again, the difference in that game, Little River has not converted a two-point conversion on three tries, so it's 24-18. to Out west in Dodge City, the Red Demons, this is a whack battle against Great Bend. Dodge City leading 28-7. to Great Bend there with the football completing the pass. Dodge City in the red uniforms. Red Demons against the Panthers of Great Bend. We heard Connor Nickel talking about Great Bend. It's kind of interesting that uh, you know they do play a lot of, they play mostly 5A, 6A teams on their schedule, and yet they are 4A. <laughs> Yeah, and, and they jumped down. They've been a pretty good 5A program here in recent memory, but a lot of those guys have all graduated. And I talked about that with Cole Reif, of course, today on Great Bend Radio uh, this morning about that. He's like, you know, we know Hayes is the team in the WAC, but, you know, how are these other teams? We really don't know. How good is Dodge City? How good is Garden City? How good is Great Bend? I still don't think that we know because there's a lot of youth on a lot of these teams, and our playmakers are gone from last year. Bo Foster, the coach's son, gone from last year at Dodge City. Of course, you look at the Brown kid, uh, of course, Fort Hayes' state coach's son. He's gone uh, from last year. Cyrus Dunlap out of Liberal. Uh, the Schremer kid out of Great Bend. Dalton Miller, the Shrine Bowl MVP, gone. So you lost so many players, and Hayes returned so many players. Uh, so there's a big question mark around the whack. The offensive production hasn't been great for any team uh, in the conference so far, but Dodge City does have some weapons. You look at the freeze kid out at wide receiver. Uh, great Ben, they're just such a question mark team this year. They've been inconsistent offensively uh, this year, and uh, we don't really know who that second best team is uh, out of the WAC conference this year. But you mentioned that 4A. All of a sudden, Leon, that 4A West becomes pretty wide open because we only have two teams that are undefeated in 4A West. And one of those is about ready to go down tonight, likely. They're down by 14 right now. McPherson losing to DeSoto, that game being played at Washburn Rural High School. That was a late addition. Andover Central, who played for the title last year's 3-0. But outside of that, you know, you have Wamigo, that's 3-1, and and Wamigo is losing right now 41 to nothing, probably to the second best team on the West in Paola, as you see on your screen. Bueller's 2-1. and one. Independence has been in quarantine for a couple weeks. Independence sounds weird, but they're on the west, even though they're in southeast Kansas. El Dorado, Augusta, Ulysses, Rose Hill, Arc City, Wellington, Winfield, Abilene, Circle, Mulvane, Great Bend. So you don't know what's going to happen out there because on paper it's McPherson and Andover Central are the favorites. But like Connor said, I know people probably think he's crazy for thinking Great Bend's 0-4 after tonight. But – they're in the conversation to maybe win a, a playoff game or two when we start looking at it. It, it is that wide open on 4A West. And there's Great Bend at Dodge City. Great Bend with the football. Dodge City up 28-7. to hey, Meanwhile, Dodge City, the voice of the Dodge City Red Demons is our good friend Sean Boston. He does a lot of work, <laughs> I know, for sports in Kansas. And I don't know if you saw this today, but it's been <laughs> proclaimed, and I think some players came up with this. It's National Sean Boston Day in Dodge City. And there's a picture on Twitter of some Dodge City Red Demon players. They're all dressed like him, wearing the uh, red or blue uh, polo that he often wears with the khakis and headsets on so sean boston he's in his third year the young man as the voice of uh, the red demons in dodge city and uh, he has made an impact out there they love him let's listen to sean right now 8 12 remaining here in the third jumbo package will stay in again ball on Right center of the field. Ivan Cordero space to the right. Matt Freeze way outside here on the near side of the left side. Nedler, waist high snap. Runs to his right. He gets taken down around the knees. He gets wrapped up there by a couple of Panthers in on the stop. Looked like first in on pursuit. That was Greg Summers, 5'8", 240-pound senior nose guard. 
And again, we're listening to Dot City uh, against Great Ben, Sean Boston, the voice of Dot City, Alden Nedler, the quarterback there for the Red Demons. I think he's the one that actually instigated this national <laughs> Sean Boston day out there in Dodge. But good for Sean that he is uh, that well, uh, well liked, well loved out there in Dodge City. By the way, it sounds like he may be broadcasting this game alone tonight. I know he lost his uh, partner a couple weeks ago, uh, Phil Stevenson, who's also the head baseball coach at Dodge City Community College. He uh, was suffering from uh, the coronavirus, had to be hospitalized. He is back home recovering and uh, doing well. He's a friend of mine, and I've kept up with him a little bit. He is feeling better, a little weak, but uh, Phil, of course, well-known as uh, one of the greatest college baseball players of all time at Wichita State, the younger brother of the, his, of the head coach, the legend Gene Stevenson. And of course, Phil went on to play for the Chicago Cubs and the San Diego Padres as well, but certainly our best of Phil. And hopefully he'll be able to get back in the broadcast booth before the end of the season to help out uh, with Sean Boston, National Sean Boston Day in that city. As the Red Demons up 28-7 to against Great Ben. Yeah, I saw that uh, on Twitter earlier today. Alden Nedler actually is the one that tweeted that and said, Happy National Sean Boston Day. And it has six different people and basically what Sean Boston wears every day, as you mentioned, with those Dodge City polos. And uh, he really likes it out there. He's been out there for, for three years and worked back and forth between there and, and Garden. I know when he moved out there originally, he was in Garden and moved over to Dodge City because he liked it so much. And uh, the voice there and uh, has really fit in. And he's done a lot of good stuff uh, for us. Uh, at sports in Kansas as well. You know, Sean first started working for us when he was 15 or 16 years old at a state track meet as kind of an intern. And now I believe Sean's 24, 23, 24 uh, years of age. So it's nice to, to see his growth and uh, his success out there. And you mentioned Phil Stevenson. The play that I always remember, I don't know, you've probably uh, seen he, it multiple times, is yeah, the, is the he, Grand he, Illusion. He, he doesn't like this because <laughs> they show it every year. Yeah, the uh, with the College World Series back in 1981, I believe, and uh, was it uh, Miami or I can't remember if Miami or Florida State, and they did the hidden ball trick, and they caught Phil off base, and it is every year it's 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 on there. In fact, I think his wife tweeted out this year, "Do we got to see it again?" <laughs> so. But he uh, at one time had the longest hitting streak in the history of college baseball. That was. Uh, uh, broken by, uh, gosh, uh, the Oklahoma State player who Nolan Ryan uh, punched out. <laughs> I can't remember his name. And then uh, Phil's got numerous records in college baseball, one of the great hitters. Joe Carter once said he was the best hitter he's ever seen. And uh, Phil living out in Dodd City, the head baseball coach at Dodd City Community College. As we switch uh, gears, this is a game we have not uh, checked in on, as it is Shawnee Mission Northwest leading St. Thomas Aquinas. 28 to 14 and uh chet you got aquinas number one i know i'm looking bad right now with this and we had ty black on sports in kansas all access this week from shawnee mission northwest to talk about playing for his dad and of course this is just game number three for them and at one point they weren't even going to have a season uh they had to fight to get their season alive and and this is a huge surprise right now and you know i know some people on that shawnee mission northwest staff that told me they should be the real deal this year but Man, this is showing that they really could be the real deal uh, with this right here because St. Thomas Aquinas is a very good team here. You see Tank Young uh, in the backfield, a two-time All-State pick and uh, one of the best with an Iowa State offer. But this is a bit surprising because defensively, I just not did not think in any way, shape, or form that Northwest would be able to limit to Aquinas and thought they would run the clock down. But so far, it looks like uh, it's been Shawnee Mission Northwest doing the scoring, not St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah, 508 left to go in the third quarter. Northwest on top of Aquinas, 28 to 14. And how about this? Uh, Shawnee Mission Northwest just stopped Aquinas on downs, fourth down. So Northwest gets the ball back. As we now resume a second half action in Canton Galva, Little River. Canton Galva in this big eight man Division I matchup. Canton Galva up 24 to 18. Again, the only difference in this game, both teams have scored three touchdowns each. But Canton Galva is 3-for-3 three three on two-point conversions. The Little River 0-for-3. Oh Little River with the football right now. This is a good one. Getting Michael Quaid from Kansas Football Friday, our own Michael Quaid at this game, providing us with an outstanding video. And finally uh, giving him a good game to shoot, too. <laughs> He's got some, this one's close. <laughs> 
they've all been good. They're all fun to watch. As, uh, oh, man, Ken Galva coming up with a big defensive stop right there. Braden Collins definitely passes the eye test. I've seen him at uh, some events and things like that. Uh, really an underrated player because, of course, last year, all the talk on quarterback Landon Everett, and then, of course, Tyson Struber, who everybody knows because of his Division One offers. And, of course, uh, the guy that not a lot of people were talking about, number 33, but it goes much deeper than Tyson Struber on this team. And, uh, Really not lacking in any spot on this team. Very, very strong uh, team in, in Canton Galva, both defensively uh, and offensively. But I'm still shocked by this left corner game here, Leon, of Shawnee Mission Northwest mm. and, and up on Aquinas. Uh, look at quarterback. It's, it's a weird number for a quarterback, but number 20, Ty Black. He's an Air Force commit. Uh, he's really added a lot of weight in the offseason and has become a dual threat. Over 2,600 yards last year, coach's son. Great quarterback. Let's listen in on this game. Northwest at St. Thomas Aquinas. And gets pushed out. Looks like just short of the first down. That'll bring us to third and three. Saints could really use a sack on one of those pass plays. And he drops back and just runs. Ball's on the 41-yard line. And it looks like the Cougars jumped. And yeah, we got a penalty there against Shawnee Mission Northwest. Again, Northwest surprising uh, St. Thomas Aquinas right now. 28 to 14. This game at Aquinas there in Overland Park. 425 left to go. So bring up third down. And uh, looks like it'll be third and eight after the penalty for Shawnee Mission Northwest. And you mentioned Ty Black, his dad, Bo Black. I, I covered him a lot when he was at uh, Great Ben and uh, really revitalized that Great Bend program. Very competitive. I think they played for a state championship when he was there in 5A. As, uh, let's uh, go back to the action right now. Black looking downfield. Pass will be incomplete. That'll bring us to fourth and eight on the 36-yard line. Out comes the P Cougars punt squad for the third time this quarter. That was some good covers by Jacob Bittner, number 25. Fourth and eight from the 36. Okay, the Aquinas defense comes up with the stop there, and uh, Shawnee Mission Northwest will have to punt the football. And let's uh, go back to Dodge City where Great Ben, the Panthers, threatening here. They're at the inside the five-yard line trying to score against Dodge City. Great Ben down 28-7, to seven, trying to punch it in, and we do have a touchdown. touchdown great Ben Jay is Cole in. From two yards out, and Great Ben gets their first touchdown since the first quarter as they get a two-yard rushing score from Jade Poe as it takes them just a couple of plays to answer that blocked punts. Poe finishes off the short drive. Tipping the extra point number 38. And Great Ben now trails 28 to 13. The extra point coming up right here as uh, it is good. And that makes it 28 to 14. Dot City on top in the third quarter. And again, listening to Sean Boston, the voice of the Red Demons out there in Dot City. Looks like a windy night out west. Those flags really blowing there. By the way, we talked about Phil Stevenson. He had the longest hitting streak. I couldn't remember the name of the guy who broke it. It was Robin Ventura. So there, get that out of the way. <laughs> it popped in my head. But uh, back to action here. Canton Galva at uh, at home against Little River and leading 24-18. to Eagles threatening again here near the 10-yard uh, line of Little River. And this has been a, a terrific. We, we expected this to be a good game between two of the top teams in eight-man Division One And, Ken Galva ranked number one, undefeated at 4-0, and it certainly has been a very competitive football game. Again, both teams scoring three touchdowns each. The only difference is that uh, Canton Galva is three for three on two-point conversions. And the thing about eight-man football as well, Leon, you could have a game that is 48 to 28, 
that means that was a really good football game in eight-man football. I don't think people quite realize that. If you see that score in 11-man, it's, it's a little bit different. Things can get a little bit out of control sometimes uh, in eight-man football, and, and scores are a little bit deceiving. Uh, but seeing a close score like this means this is a very good football game. It certainly is. It's been a battle back and forth, and both teams have kind of a balanced attack, primarily having success running the football, but both uh, demonstrating they can really go downfield with a long pass, stretch the field a little bit. Here is a touchdown up the middle and into the end zone for the score. Canton Galva now up 30-18. to 18. They made that one look easy. Braden Collins in for another score tonight. We've seen him defensively, now seen him offensively with a couple scores tonight. And uh, Kenton Gallo looking really good, showing that they can do multiple things besides just going to the air with Struber. And, and last year, you, of course, saw your quarterback that was a senior player of the year and, and stepping in for him as sophomore this year. So big shoes to fill for that sophomore out there. Kenton Galva trying to make it four for four on two-point conversions, and indeed they do. Now 32 to 16. Let's go back to Dodds. Well, now we're going to, uh, back to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, where Shawnee Mission Northwest. Back to Dodge City. Great Ben had just scored. They got the ball back on an onside kick. Let's listen in to Sean Boston as the Panthers have some momentum. Three fifty-five at County to go in third period. In three backs behind Joseph Mater, they all space out. Sideways. Handoff. Hopperman again gets hit, and it was that Nether again. Alden Nether has plowed over Gavin Hopperman twice tonight. And we hear Sean Boston uh, mentioning Alden Nedler. And, uh, yeah, again, we've talked about that young man, outstanding athlete, really good baseball player as well. And I understand he may be getting – he's getting some looks uh, from the college ranks as well. Yeah, he is the WAC Defensive Player of the Year last year. And keep in mind, all of those guys with Division One offers from Hayes play in the WAC. Uh, and, of course, some good players from Garden City as well that have graduated or are still there. So, Alt Nedler, one of the best players, not just in the Western Athletic Conference, one of the best defensive players in Class 6A. We've seen him at quarterback a little bit, but great size, about 6'2 and a half, 215 pounds, I believe has one FCS offer. And I'm a bit surprised he's not uh, recruited a little bit harder. He has the ideal size uh, for the position, has some speed to him as well, some toughness. Uh, and I think he's kind of a hidden talent out there in western Kansas, but uh, definitely will be a, a contender this year to be WAC Player of the Year once again. And here's St. Thomas Aquinas against Shawnee Mission Northwest. Aquinas going deep into the end zone, and that is a replay. <laughs> Incomplete pass as we just <laughs> jumped in on that. That's how we do it here. We're just jumping in on these games as we, we go boom, boom, boom across the state of Kansas. But Aquinas with the football first and 10, third quarter down 28 to 14. As, uh, again, Aquinas, uh, our number one team overall in the state of Kansas rank, but they are down by a couple of touchdowns and a surprise here against the Cougars. By the way, a cross-town uh, rivalry game just outside of Wichita, Goddard Eisenhower uh, now leads uh, Goddard 10 to 7 in the third quarter. Wow. And once and you again, look you're watching... at Aquinas out here tonight, Leon, number eight for Aquinas has been the backup quarterback, Maxwell Ford. Uh, Blake Anderson injured, so senior quarterback number 10, he is not playing tonight. So certainly we've seen mm. that. My last, maybe it's my my number one. My number ones is that what's going on here? Because Cooper Marsh <laughs> got hurt yeah. with Mill Valley, and now Aquinas, you know, the, the same thing here. He was, of course, I believe injured uh, last week, but that's a major factor. All of a sudden, you got a, a guy, of course, in Cooper Marsh of Mill Valley that you know, on, one of the best this. quarterbacks in the state. Little River just uh, taking it down. Another long run down to the one yard line. Little River not going away against Canton Galva. Jaden Garrison on the carry there for Little River to keep this a game here in the third quarter. And that's what's so fun about eight man sometimes. These, these games can change so fast. And you get to that edge and have a little bit of speed and a couple plays, bam, uh, you're back in the game. So, certainly uh, interesting here is uh, this has been an outstanding eight man football game. You mentioned Blake Anderson again of St. Thomas Aquinas. We saw him a few weeks ago. He's an outstanding quarterback, makes some terrific decisions on the field, maybe even a little underrated as a, as a quarterback for that team. Yeah, and doesn't get to throw a lot because, of course, they're a team that runs the flex bone, and 
you know, to be the St. Thomas Aquinas quarterback for Randy Dryling, you got to be very smart. You got to make a lot of reads because that's a crisp offense. Well, this is a guy thrown into the fire as a sophomore. Same thing happened with Mill Valley last week. So uh, there's going to be some rust. As back to St. Thomas Aquinas, they have the football. Little River just scored the touchdown, if you saw that, and that makes it now 32 to 24. And Little River will try again for a two point conversion. Right now they are 0 for 3. Let's check in and see if the uh, if Little River can uh, convert the two-point conversion for the first time tonight. Again, that has been the difference in this game as they are trying for the two-point conversion. Two receivers wide to the left. And uh, going to roll. No, he's going to keep it. And just shy of the end zone yes 0 for 4 little river on two point conversions canton galva four for four that is again the difference in the ball game eight points 32 to 24 that's amazing once again we had little river canton galva in your bottom right upper left at st thomas aquinas at home against shawnee mission northwest lower left Great Ben at Dodge City. Great Ben with the football. Singer at the Dodge City 24-yard line. They just said scored to make it a 28-14 game, trying to get back in the end zone. The Panthers against the Dodge City Red Demons, a battle in the Western Athletic Conference. And we uh, talk about this. Uh, this is games being played at Memorial Stadium in Dodge City. I think it was announced today. Next week, Wellington and Ulysses will play a neutral site game in Dodge City at Memorial Stadium. Now, how neutral would that be, really, for for Wellington? I guess. Well, I, I was kind of wondering about far. that. <laughs> Two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about 90 miles from Dodge City to Ulysses. Of course, Ulysses. Uh, really out there on an island as a 4A school in southwest Kansas. Not a, not a lot of teams to, to play in 4A out there. Here's a pass play from the uh, Panthers, a great band, and that ball is incomplete uh, just at the goal line. Quick replay. So we watch. That's a perfect pass, too. Just dropped it. And I am reminded, too, Ulysses is on the schedule to play Dodge City this year. They were one of the uh, replacement games after Dodge City lost a number of opponents uh, due to the pandemic situation. How would you like to be Ulysses AD? <laughs> I think didn't uh, I mean, they it, play it's a crazy. district? Weren't they playing a district game a few years ago at Pittsburgh or in Vice and Pittsburgh wasn't was it, traveling was, out to wasn't Ulysses? It di- wasn't a district game. It was a home and away, and oh. they they did it in the same the same season. They did it with Altamont Labette County which isn't as far as Pittsburgh, but if you're Pittsburgh, or if you're Pittsburgh, you get a closer game almost in Nashville. You get a closer game in Memphis. You get a closer game in Dallas, Texas. We're talking uh, Tennessee I mean, here. This, <laughs> Nashville, yeah, Tennessee. Wow. Tennessee. I mean, you look you look at their schedule last year, and I believe it was last year. There's one year that Ulysses had. They played back-to-back games. I'm trying to pull it up here. I know K-Preps has that, and I'll – pulled up on that schedule to read off how crazy that it is. Here it is. Uh, Ulysses' 2018 schedule. They played Colby, Goodland, Hugoton, Scott City. Of course, those are common opponents in their league. And then they, uh, they're they in 4A. And the reason why they play those teams early on is because everybody's locked into district after that. Well, they played Pittsburgh um, at home. And then they were open. They couldn't find a game. They went to Labette County. And then how about this? They had to go to Abilene for their week eight matchup of the year scheduled and then they go to the playoffs because everybody makes them right they had to go back to abilene the next week that's who they got scheduled oh my consecutively and then uh to mcpherson so you know some of those road trips aren't crazy but you know back-to-back years they had to play a southeast kansas opponent because what's happened here with teams you know they're in a great west activities conference and within that you have colby holcomb Hugoton, of course, Scott City, Goodland, and Cimarron, all those schools I mentioned are 3A or 2A. Well, once week four hits, those schools are locked into district games, and then that leaves Ulysses with nobody to play. So that's how sure. that's uh, really affected some schools. Yeah, I'm not sure I have this right, but I think the closest 4A school to Ulysses is Pratt. I'm not positive about that, but I think that's what I, I was told. So, And Pratt's 3A now in football. So, mm, so Don't forget that one. By the way, we got a pretty good battle of Hutchinson and Andover, a game in the fourth quarter. It's 7-7. Seven to seven. The Salthawks uh, trying to remain unbeaten against Andover, but 7-7 seven to seven in the fourth quarter. 
as St. Thomas Aquinas trying to get on the board here against Shawnee Mission Northwest, threatening as they're inside the 10-yard line. No secret what they're going to do here, try to pound it in on the ground as that was first and goal to go. That'll bring up second down. Good defense there by the Cougars of Shawnee Mission Northwest. The alma mater of Ryan Lilja, former K-State great Super Bowl champion with the Indianapolis Colts and Peyton Manning. One of the great stories of, uh, as now we see Canton Galva into the end zone scoring once again. They always have an answer when Little River scores, they score. And uh, it is now 38-24, and they'll try to make it now 5 for 5 on the two-point conversions as that's become the kind of a, the narrative of this game for me anyway. Tyson Struber on the score there. We've seen him with an interception tonight, a two-point conversion. Uh, he's the real deal, and, and they could go to him almost any play they want to go to him, and, and I'm surprised they don't go to him a little bit more uh, than they could, but they, they just, they're just they so dynamic and uh, have a good backfield, a good line, and multiple guys they can go to. As Aquinas also looking to score, and you have the Tankster, Tank Young, uh, in the backfield, two-time All-State selection, uh, now a senior. To answer your question, Leon, I think the closest 4A school to Ulysses as far as 4A West this year the closest uh, playoff game that they could have is Great Bend, and that is 161.9 miles, two hours and 44 minutes. But but get this as well. We talked about that west and how crazy that that is. Well, also on that west is a school that uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier who's playing Chanute tonight is Independence, Kansas. So we could actually see a playoff matchup between Ulysses and Independence, and that would be 11 hours, probably 12 hours on a bus round trip. Wow. Ulysses either maybe want to look into building another high school, have two high schools, <laughs> or get a jet. Have, have, them both be, have them both be two A's and then don't travel. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's amazing. As we head back to this is Bishop Meage in St. James Academy is uh, Bishop Meage on top there. And uh, St. Thomas Aquinas trying to get it in the end zone. Third down and goal to go against Shawnee Mission Northwest as the Cougars with the surprise so far. This game, 9.55 to go. Touchdown, and Aquinas, St. Thomas Aquinas gets it in. That brings the game to be a one possession game as the Saints defense takes the field. Sorry, as the Saints special team takes the field to kick the field goal. There you go, Shani, or St. Thomas Aquinas gets in the end zone. That's going to make it a 28 to 20, uh, pending the extra point attempt coming up here. And uh, Aquinas with Randy Dryley. They're, they're not going away. This is going to, I think it's going to be a big finish here one way or the other. As, uh, it looks like Aquinas' defense has really stepped up here in the second half. And uh, the extra point uh, was waved off. I don't know if he... Whistles blow be blue before the uh, the snap, so they'll try it again. I assume. As once again, 28-20, Shiny Mission Northwest on top. And I mentioned Ryan Lilja, one of the most successful the players to come out of the state of Kansas, and uh, from Shiny Mission Northwest. Here's that extra point, and it is good, 28-21. So it's a touchdown lead for Northwest. But uh, he's one of the great stories of perseverance. <laughs> And uh, to never give up, as he had some uh, difficult situations happen to him in high school, and he stuck with it and, again, went on to play at K-State, where he's an outstanding player, offensive lineman, went on to the NFL, played for the Indianapolis Colts, won a Super Bowl as a starting center, and then, uh, of course, uh, went on to play, uh, finished his career with the hometown Kansas City Chiefs. As we check in on Great Ben at Dodge City, Great Ben going deep again. Pass incomplete. Don City on top there, 28-14. Back to Canton Galva. See if Little River, they've had an answer for every touchdown Canton Galva's put up. Uh, see if they can do it again. They're down now 40-24. to Yeah, you mentioned Ryan Lilja, of course, class of 2000 from there. Uh, Under-recruited and missed his senior year at Shawnee Mission Northwest. And they list him as 6'2". He's maybe 6'1". He's, he's beat the odds at all levels, really. Started 104 games, uh, but didn't start out at Kansas State. He was a two-year starter mm -hmm. at Coffeyville Community College and had to get that scholarship by going there first and then became all Big 12 and then part of that 
really good 2003 team, of course, that we saw uh, run OU out of Arrowhead Stadium uh, back in the day with Darren Sproles and then Chiefs practice squad cut there. Gets to Indianapolis, plays, with, of course, with Peyton Manning, wins a Super Bowl, and then comes back to the Chiefs and then ended as a Bronco, I believe, on the, the practice squad. But, uh, man, you talk about a successful career because, you know, center guard played a little bit of both, undrafted free agent, to playing a long time in the NFL, nine or ten years. Well, and he is a great lesson for kids, and we can tell the story because he's told it many times. It's been well publicized. His senior year in high school, he was at a party where alcohol was being served. There was a zero-tolerance policy of the school for the football players. He was kicked off the team, and uh, he lost, you know, uh, big schools lost interest in him, Division One, so he had to go to Coffeeville and, and kind of reprove himself, and which he did, and went on to K-State, and as we just mentioned, he had a terrific career in the NFL, and he talked about he got cut there from K- Kansas City. I was uh, covering the Chiefs back then, working in TV in Kansas City, and they, they did cut him from the practice squad, but they were hoping, they, they thought that he might be kind of hidden, that no one was going to pick him up. And, boy, the Colts picked him up immediately. They had been scouting the Chiefs <laughs> a little bit on that, and uh, it paid off for them. paid off for him as well. As, uh, once again, Ken Galvin with the football, the incomplete pass. And I think the most impressive thing that we've seen with Shawnee Mission Northwest tonight, Ty Lindeman was one of the state's leading receivers and is a preferred walk-on in Illinois now. He's gone off this team. So not only have they beefed up that defense uh, that's much improved from a year ago, but now we're seeing Shawnee Mission Northwest go with the best of the best here. And all of a sudden now maybe they're a factor in Class 6A football. Is There's a long list of contenders now because we're figuring more and more out about teams or maybe there's some players not playing tonight that we don't know about or whatnot and some surprises, but I don't care. You look at that big offensive line, of course, that you have up front and you have a quarterback that has started the last three years for your program, the coach's son, like having a second coach on the field that's headed to the Air Force Academy that's added a running game to his already big-time arm. Uh, This team's certainly a factor and will be in a lot of ballgames this year, but this is definitely – maybe one of the biggest surprises of the night to me. And by the way, being a Western Kansas guy and working in Central Kansas for a long time, I kind of like the idea. I like seeing these uh, coaches who were really successful out West go to the you know the Johnson County, Kansas City area and become successful. You know, we've got Bo Black, who came from Great Bend and Hayes, Randy Dryling, of course, from Hutchinson, uh, Ryan Cornelson now at Gardner Edgerton, and, uh, of course, Clint Ryder. Coming from Heston to Blue Valley Northwest, those guys can coach. And uh, it's like the big schools up in the Kansas City area certainly have taken notice and uh, and brought them on as their head coach. Yeah, it's impressive to see. And you always wonder, you know, how styles will contrast or what the difference will be. And some people, maybe just Western Kansas coaches or Central Kansas coaches, whatever it may be. I mean, for a lot of years, Marvin Diener, of course, at Salina Central and then comes up to Gardner Edgerton. I know the end of his career wasn't necessarily great at Gardner, but uh, he had a lot of good teams there with Bubba Starling and Trey Wrench and, and guys like that. But Man, I mean, you talk about all of a sudden, you know, coming over from a different part of the state, new teams, and the difference, I think, that I've heard from some of those coaches, uh, and they're not speaking down on the leagues, but maybe they're in some league, you know, in the city league or the AVCTL or for the WAC, for that matter, there's some off weeks sometimes where you're going to play an opponent and you know you're going to win that game that week. Whereas if you're St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, or Mill Valley, or these teams that Mill Valley is now Sunflower. But if you're these teams in the EKL, all of a sudden you start looking, you're like, well, there's four or five teams here that have won a state title here in recent memory. And you just, you know, Clint Ryder t- talked about that a few weeks ago. There's just no weeks off because all of a sudden he's a team that's one and eight, two and seven, zero oh and nine, and now he's two and zero. Oh. So you just never know what's going to happen in those leagues. Well, having worked in both the Wichita and Kansas City markets, uh, one thing that stood out to me covering high school football once I was in Kansas City, the scores were a lot more competitive on Friday night as they came across. And, and there were a lot more blowouts out west, and especially in the City League. And uh, it's just the way it was. It's just a little more imbalanced. But as uh, Canton Galva just wow. come, has come that out with an interception, interception, juggling catch there. And uh, the Eagles stop Little River here. Little River trying to answer back, trailing 40 to 24. Uh, But as you mentioned, that was a terrific catch.
Looks like St. James Academy is about to score against Bishop Mies, and yes, they are. Academy, what a play by Dakota Bird and Jimmy White doing it again. Unbelievable vision by our quarterback. Great job by Dakota to see Jimmy to his to his left as he was about to cross the line of scrimmage, firing it just before he went beyond the line of scrimmage. And Jimmy, obviously, with that acceleration, that speed, just being able to finish that play. There you go, St. James Academy with a long pass play and the touchdown. And now Canton Galva moving the ball and getting down in on the near the goal line again on the five yard line of Little River. The Eagles really trying to go up big here now. As this has been a, a close game throughout, but now Canton Galva for a chance to really extend their advantage. We'll play up the middle, maybe yard on that play as Canton Galva up 40 to 24 on the Little River Redskins. And it's always very interesting to me in eight man one football sometimes because of districts in east and west. I mean, sometimes you may see one year where a team's west, the next year uh, they're east. And we've certainly seen that in sometimes 3A, 4A levels, whether that's Holton or Hayden or Marysville or Riley County uh, that have been on you know both sides of the state. And maybe some of those teams are contenders and competitors for both of that. I mean, heck, Gardner Edgerton is so close to the Missouri line, but due to not having really any teams, you know, all the Wichita teams are west. And we don't have very many 6A teams, but two west of Wichita, really. Of course, Garden City and Dodge City. Well, that leaves you got to have a certain amount of teams on the west. And then you got to start picking out some of those Kansas City teams that are populated. So you could have Garden City versus Gardner Edgerton in a week one playoff. So, you know, we call it east west, but it really isn't. Braden Collins looks like uh, in for another score. For Canton Galva, I believe that's number 33. Yes, it is. Again, as they extend their lead, 46 to 24. And see if they can convert another two-point conversion as they are perfect tonight on the two-point conversions. And for a while, that was the difference in this game as Little River failed on every one of its uh, two-point uh, conversion attempts. They are uh, 0 for 3 on that as uh, it is now 46-24, Canton Galva. Trying to make it six for six. Little River over four, I should say, and they do. They somehow get into the end zone. Nice effort there to get across the goal line, and that's going to make it 48 to 24, Canton Galva. And uh, this might be one of those games or one of those final scores that's not indicative of how close it was. Is that fair to say, Chet? After watching this game, absolutely. Absolutely, and you see a lot of eight-man games like that will pull away, and you think, oh, it was a blowout, it wasn't a good game. Well, it's been a good game the whole time, and as you mentioned, the difference between the whole game has been the two-point conversion uh, for the most part. So definitely a, a good game, and, and glad our uh, camera and Michael Quaid are there tonight. And up at uh, Dodge City, Red Demons trying to score again as they are inside now the five-yard line against Great Bend. Dodge City up 28-14 to 14 in this whack battle. That ball now marked at the five-yard line. And got some finals coming in across the state. And uh, as my score guy uploaded one of these wrong, I got to change it because he's got a final for St. Thomas Aquinas going out. And I know that's not final because it's not. We're watching it. Paola, 48. Wamigo, 7. Chase County, 46. Flint Hill, 0. Fort Scott improves to 3-0. and uh, Out of quarantine, of course, been off for a couple weeks. They beat Labette County, 14-8 to tonight. Smith Center beating Oakley, 42 uh, to 14. Smoky Valley leading Goodland 14 to 6 in the fourth quarter. Galena leading Caney 20 to nothing. DeSoto leading McPherson in a highlighted matchup between 5A, 4A, 41 to 28 at Washburn Rural. They're playing that uh, because that was a late late edition game. And once again, we're at Bishop Age and St. James Academy. And St. James uh, had just scored a touchdown. They're only down 28-21. This game in the third quarter at the clock at 5.19 to go in the third. So St. James hanging in there against uh, Bishop Miege. Again, that is a home game for St. James, but they play their games on Bishop Miege's field. So 
home uh, home game for St. James, but uh, Bishop Age not uh, not doing any traveling tonight, obviously. So they're playing on their home field. Little River back with a football after that touchdown from Canton Galva, trying a little shovel pass there, and uh, was that picked off? Is uh, incomplete pass and uh, St. Uh, Little River retained possession as we go back to uh, St. James and Bishop Miege against uh, Bishop Miege in the red pants, white jerseys. St. James Academy, a relatively new high school, I believe less than 20 years old. It was uh, early uh, 2000, around 04, 05 uh, that school opened. As we see a replay there is now we're back to Action, and now Dodge City trying to score against Great Ben here on the five-yard line. Alden Nedler out of the uh, shotgun. He's going to throw the football, and he's got his man in the end zone for the touchdown, Dodge City. Red Demons up now 34-14 to as they celebrate the TD. And Dodge now goes up 34-14. Great play-action pass there. And Dodge made that look easy. Matt Fries with his fourth touchdown reception of the season. Good snap. The kick is through. 7.21 to go in the ball game. Dodge City leads 35-14. There you go. Dodge City up 35-14. Alden Nedler with a touchdown pass to Matt Fries. Rolling out to his right. little play action, as Sean Boston mentioned, and... Wide open for the TD, and Dodge City uh, takes a three-touchdown lead over Great Bend. Back to action at Canton Galva, Little River, down 48-24 to against the top-ranked Eagles of eight-man Division I. Another score from the City League, uh, Wichita East in the uh, fourth quarter, leading height 16-6. East looking to uh, stay un unbeaten. Not quite the point total they've put out the last couple weeks, as we mentioned, but uh, they also lost their starting quarterback early. Deontay Mitchell went out of the game. Not sure what happened to him. They're operating with a backup quarterback, but leading now Wichita Heights. Meanwhile, Lathan North has uh, defeated Gardner Edgerton 28-7. to So Gardner Edgerton, after the big surprise victory over Mill Valley a week ago, cannot uh, stay on the winning side tonight, losing against Olathe North 28-7. Olathe North, though, now 4-0 and on the season. St. Thomas Aquinas trying to come back to tie this game against uh, Shawnee Mission Northwest. Northwest, the surprise, they were up 28-14. Now it's a 28-21 game. Aquinas is uh, trying to score again here in the fourth quarter. Four fifty left to go in this game. Aquinas. That's the uh, replay of the play from uh, just previously. Unless it was the exact same pass play and catch. <laughs> but, no, that's a big play for, for the Saints right there. And that's a big-time play for a sophomore quarter. That's a big-time play for anybody, Leon. But it's a big-time play for a, a guy that's starting you know, his first game tonight, a sophomore quarterback thrown into the fire on one of the state's best teams against a really good Class 6A team. So that's a big-time throw, stepping up and making that throw with under four minutes remaining when you're trailing in one of the top teams in the state. Let's listen in on this game as it comes uh, to its conclusion, perhaps. Shut down for a short loss. Three twenty-five and rolling left in the fourth quarter. Saints down by a touchdown. It is second eleven on the Cougars' twenty-five yard line. Board with the pass play is looking and Horn just short of the touchdown. Oh, just short of the touchdown. Brought down near the one yard line. First down, St. Thomas Aquinas. Oh, there's Smart some excitement the there, line. isn't there? St. Thomas Aquinas, <laughs> a big touch or big pass completion. He just fell down at the one yard line, and uh, pretty good call from our young broadcaster there, as he was uh, excited. St. Thomas Aquinas, though, now threatening to score and tie this game, and we'll continue uh, to listen in as well as soon as they get back to action. Here we got a little break here as they 
bring in the play. Don't be surprised if they go for two two here either, Leon. Once they score here, do not be surprised if they go for two with Tank Young in the backfield. Let's see what happens. And the handoff to Tank Young! Touchdown, St. Thomas Aquinas! A huge touchdown for the Saints. A one-yard run by, this by game Tank Young. For the PAT. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas has come back from a 28-14 deficit. It's now made it, makes it 28-27. And it looks like, Chet, they're going to kick the extra point and tie this game up with 3.05 left to go. Wow. I thought I, was, I agreed with you. I thought Randy Dryley would go for two and uh, and take the lead late, but just under three minutes to go, and Aquinas comes back to tie it up, 28-28 against Shawnee Mission Northwest. Wow. By the way, those are two coaches that have gone up against each other before. We talked about Bo Black coming from Western Kansas at coaching Great Ben and Hayes. He he went up against uh, Randy Dryling and Hutchinson a few times, I, if I recall correctly. So, But here they are again tonight in Overland Park, and Aquinas coming back from a 28-14 deficit. The Saints tying this game with just under three minutes to go. So once again, we have up in your upper right, uh, that is Hoxie. That's Bishop Miege in St. James Academy, 28-21. to 21. And that game is still in the third quarter, is that correct? Uh, Bishop Miege leading 28-21 over St. James. Yeah, we're kind of wondering about, we're going to check that, double check that, because it's getting awful late for that to be uh, a couple minutes left in the third. Dodd City, uh, Great Ben, the Red Demons had just scored. They're up 35 to 14. Great Ben back with the football and uh, completing the pass. A little, a little screen jailbreak type play there as uh, they pick up some good yardage and knocked out of bounds on the far sideline. And meanwhile, our feature game, it looks like Canton Galva down in near bottom. There we go, full screen. They just scored again to go up 54 to 24, really starting to blow it out now against uh, Little River. But once again, Little River very competitive in this game until well, just the last few, last few minutes here in the fourth quarter. You know, there's quite a bit of time left. But Canton Galva, they... They just kind of wear you down. They are, as you mentioned, Chet, very strong team. They got some some big kids and some speed and and everything to go with it. As they uh, once again go for two, and they have not missed a two point conversion tonight. Wow! And they got it again. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> he threw it up for grabs and they got it. Oh boy! Fifty six. Incredible to effort 24. by the quarterback there. Seven for seven on two-point conversions, and how about that last one? Which reminds me, you put up video after we're, we're off the air of interesting plays across the state, and I think it was Colony Crest last week had a kid who threw the ball oh my gosh. backwards over his head, no look, and uh, completed for a touchdown. One of the crazy – I had to watch it like 20 times to realize what was happening in it, and the kid walks off the field like it's no big deal. It's it's one of the craziest plays uh, that I've seen. And then last night we see a, a deal come in. Um, I put, who needs my homes? Burling game, eighth grader, J.D. Tyson to Timmy Roberts for the two-point conversion. Throws a behind-the-back pass on a two-point conversion. Oh, man. About as smooth as you possibly can see. And that had over 50,000 combined views on all of our platforms of an eighth-grade game. And Burling game versus Holby. So there's some crazy stuff that you see. That Colony Crest game, uh, two-point play or whatever it was, was incredible last week. Now this behind the back, was this design or this kid just do this on his own? I can't imagine an eighth-grade coach. Uh, I, I would imagine it's probably on his own. I don't know. I'll have to check in on that. His I think Mahomes is causing some problems. Me, so. Mahomes is causing some problems here. <laughs> His influence may not be uh, all that good <laughs> at times, but you know the more I, I the more I watched the play where the kid threw the ball over his head, no look. The more I looked at it, I realized you know this is actually a pretty good play because nobody on the defense thought he was going to throw the ball. The offense, his receiver, is certainly ready you know ready for it to go up and catch it. So I, the more I watched, I thought you know this is this isn't a bad idea because nobody knew it was coming except the guy who caught it. <laughs> Look kind of like Larry Bird making a back in the day of one of his uh, no look passes as 
as we go back to Aquinas, Shawnee Mission Northwest. The Aquinas defense has played great here in the second half, and once again, they have forced a punt, and they have taken this punt return back all the way. Let's listen in. The lead off of a touchdown punt return wow. by number 12, Dana Brooks. This stadium is in awe right now. There's a flag on the play, however. Oh, no. If you just joined us again, St. Thomas Aquinas apparently just scored a. Let's see again what we have here. I think we made. I mean, that was crazy. I think we had an unsportsmanlike conduct now, penalty after the touchdown. The touchdown will stand 34 to 28. 20 unanswered points now from Aquinas to come up the extra point on the punt return. How about that, Chet? Incredible, and I think they were – that's 21 unanswered right now if he makes this extra point, I believe. Yeah, it was 28-14, to 14 and uh, in the second half, Aquinas' defense has really come up big here in the second half. I think that's four straight four and outs for Shawnee Mission Northwest. The extra point is good, and that makes it now 35-28. Aquinas on top by the touchdown. They were down 28-14, now up 35-28. to 28. Let's look at this again. And listen in. A flag thrown on the field. Unsure about what it's for. Okay, that was the uh, that was the touchdown that just uh, put Aquinas on top. The extra point is good. Uh, apparently, another penalty on the extra point attempt. But uh, Aquinas is up now, 35-28. A minute 45 left to go in that game, and what a comeback for Randy Dryling's team up there in Overland Park tonight. Well, we had so some I guess they ones. can still remain in my uh, top spot. if they. Yeah, you had them number one. No problem, man. You didn't jinx them. No problem. Again, playing without their starting quarterback, Blake Anderson, and uh, the sophomore uh, backup coming out. Uh, impressive. Had a great pass play that uh, got him the uh, tying touchdown, or led to the tying touchdown. So as we go back to Canton Galva, where the uh, Eagles of Canton Galva really stretched it out against uh, Little River, now leading 56-24. Here's Little River with the football on the run. And again, if you just joined us, this game has been a lot more competitive, a lot closer than this score would indicate. Little River has been in it the entire game, except in the well, final, well, the start of the fourth quarter, it's gotten away from them, Canton Galva. You know, against a team like uh, the Eagles of Canton Galva, you nearly have to score every time and obviously convert your two-point conversions. We've, we've seen that. But uh, Little River finally got stopped, and then that just seemed to really turn the tide in this football game. Once again, Canton Galva, perfect 7-for-7 seven seven on their two-point conversions, make it 56-24. to 24. And Little River with the football, a little delayed run there from the quarterback up the middle. Good run. First down for the for Little River. By the way, Wichita East has held on the beat. Wichita Heights tonight, 16-13. So the Blue Aces might be for real in the City League. I got one for you, Leon. How about this? Uh-oh. Wichita Northwest, if this is right, it's coming in off scores in Kansas. Wichita Northwest, oh boy. 92. Wichita North, 0. Man, they have put up the big scores as well. Steve Martin is not afraid to let off the gas or keep the gas uh, <laughs> pedal going down. <laughs> they uh, the prolific scoring team the last few years. They finally got the defense to go with it last year when Mark Marinelli became over as defensive coordinator from Goddard Eisenhower where he was the head coach. And they seem to have the complete package, again, playing Wichita North, a team that is, well, quite frankly uh, – Outmanned a lot of Friday nights. They lost uh, earlier this season 80 to nothing against Wichita East, but in Northwest, 92, Wichita North, zero. So, man. Wow. Back to great Ben Dodd City and uh, great Ben trying to score a pass incomplete there in the corner of the end zone. Wichita Northwest, a lot of talent. And of course, we talk about Kansas kids doing well in the next level. They got a young man, Brees Hall who uh, had a terrific uh, performance last week for Iowa State. 
great running back, Iowa State victory. Uh, yeah, he was a freshman All-American last year, and, of course, he didn't redshirt. You know, he was a kid that went right into that program, rushed for 800 yards a year ago, was, you know, all Big 12 freshman team, All-American freshman team, and I believe second team all Big 12. And he's already had a couple games this year over 100 yards. So he's had an absolutely outstanding year. Some other finals across the state. Uh, we mentioned that Wichita Northwest winning 92 to nothing over North. Victoria holds off Central Plains 28 to 14 in an outstanding eight-man matchup. Bueller beating Augusta 41 to 21. DeSoto and McPherson ended up being a pretty good one. DeSoto winning 41 to 35. Hoisington beating Minneapolis 27 to 6. 3A Perry LeCompton beating Winfield, who's 4A 41 to 13. Uh, in that one. So some pretty good games across the state as many of those go final across scores in Kansas. Parsons beating Baxter Springs 42-14. to Topeka Hayden beating Osawatomie 43-6. to Holton 64-6 to over Royal Valley. Wichita Collegiate goes to 5-0 and as they beat Wichita Trinity 45 or 55-14 to rather. Atchison beating Turner tonight 56-6. to How about this one? Mill Valley 52, Lawrence Free State 0 final. Wow, Mill Valley Washburn bouncing Rural, back big. Big time win there. And Free State was a program that lost their running back, of course, and uh, but had some key pieces back. Still a good program. Washburn Rural beating Emporia 21-14. to Olathe Northwest beating Olathe South 23-16. to And the Owls of Garden Plain winning over Chaparral 37-0. to Back to that Hoisington score at Minneapolis. Uh, Hoisington won again 27 to 6. And remember, it was 7 to 6 at halftime. So Hoisington scores 20 unanswered points in the uh, second half to win that game. A team we've uh, been watching uh, throughout the year, a team that has a chance to do something, of course, in the postseason, the Cardinals of Hoisington. Once again, we're watching Bishop Miege against St. James Academy. Miege now up by 10, 31 21. And this game uh, in the fourth quarter, about nine minutes to go. Summer and I think that Hoisington team just uh, – that Hoisington team, I think, just wears you down so much. I spoke of having four or five running backs to carry the football. Well, you're not having a guy that's getting 35 carries and wearing him down. You can go to multiple guys, and they're just going to run, run, run at you, kind of like those Holton teams have done over the years and not going to pass a whole lot. And they'll wear teams down in the second half, and uh, we've certainly seen that this year so far in a couple of their games. Dodge City has the ball back against Great Bend. The Red Demons coming up with an interception in the end zone, so they have the ball uh, on on offense now, uh, leading 35-14. to 14. Red Demons of Dodge City at home at Memorial Stadium tonight. Going back to Wichita, Northwest, North score. North losing the 92 to nothing. Northwest on top, and, man, Wichita North is the second it, it largest. It looks like Shawnee Mission Northwest has just scored, Leon. Let's, let's check in on that game, Mike, and let's see what's going on. It is 35-34, and Northwest looks is going like to go for two. going for the two-point conversion. Thanks need to stop here. Gutsy Thanks call really by here. the Cougars. Motion in the backfield. Black looking on the near side, and it'll be incomplete! The pass will be incomplete! Incomplete! Saints keep the lead, 35-34, with 38 seconds left in the fourth quarter! Oh, and my goodness. Huge play well, how by the about Saints that? D. Fortune favors the and bold. I, I think that's a call you got to make, and you got to go for it there. I don't blame, blame Bo Black with his son out there and a chance to, to win this game. you got to go for that. Yeah, the replay, replay here. Here's Ty Black uh, rolling, and he had him maybe in the back of the end zone, just threw it behind him, incomplete. And uh, Aquinas looks like they're going to hang on for the victory. Uh, they run out the clock here, 38 seconds to go, 35-34. I agree, you had to go for two. You don't want to get in a, you know, in the uh, overtime rules. It's basically a shootout, and I'm not sure you want to do that against Aquinas. And uh, might as well take the lead if you got the shot. And they, they went for it and just did not get it. But what a, what, a, what a call by Bo Black. Either way, it's pretty gutsy. And it looks like our Dodge City game has completed, and that's going to be Dodge City over Great Bend 35-14 to as they uh, have left the field. But, wow, what a game. at St. Thomas Aquinas tonight is holding on the Saints for this uh, 
Looks like a victory. 56-24 here, Canton Galva on top of Little River. Little River trying to punch one in, though, again. They've got the ball deep. Canton Galva territory. Going to the air here, rolling out to his right. Throws across the field, and that's always a dangerous play. An incomplete, nearly picked off. Incomplete. Man, this has been a good night for some competitive, exciting football games across the state of Kansas, Chet. Yeah, so some really good games. We didn't think in any way, shape, or form that probably Shawnee Mission Northwest would have an opportunity to, to win the game. Uh, not only that, a, a little while ago, you know, we thought they were on their ears 28 to 14 and that, and they were leading. But that was the shocker of the night seeing that. But seeing the comeback from Aquinas is even more impressive. Uh, them being down with a sophomore quarterback, making a big throw, and really utilizing that offensive line and making some adjustments really defensively for that second half. So. Shout out to the Saints, of course, defensive coordinator Chad McKinnis, head coach Randy Dryling, and the sophomore quarterback out there getting the big win. But also hats off to, to Ty Black, Blow Black, and, and company there at Shawnee Mission Northwest. Uh, this shows that they're for real, Leon. If, if they can hang around here with a team like St. Thomas Aquinas, I can tell you something right now. They are a contender to go deep in Class 6A because oftentimes are, some years that Class 5A state champion team might be better. Uh, than that of the Class 6A champion team. Maybe not always, but certainly a contender. There you see it. There's the final 35-34. St. Thomas Aquinas comes back from a 30 or 28 to 14 deficit to take the 35 to 28 lead, and then Shawnee Mission Northwest came back to score and went for two, and maybe the victory. Uh, they did not get the two point conversion, so Aquinas hangs on for the one point victory, 35-34. Great game up in Overland Park tonight as Chet Kuplin's number one team in the state hangs on for victory. We got West Making Franklin good, here I against guess. Humboldt. And this game is at, uh, give me, what we got here? Uh, West Franklin at Humboldt. In one of the best 2A stadiums that you will see. I was in just Kansas. going to ask it you is, about this. This looks like a, a pretty it's big incredible. One. Yeah. It's incredible. They have the Monarch Cement Company and B&H trailer hitches in that company, and uh, they, they put together these unbelievable facilities here that you see probably about six, seven years ago. And, you know, I grew up playing against Humboldt, and they used to play on Walter Johnson Field, which was a baseball and football stadium there. Well, now all of a sudden they got this brand-new complex outside of town that not only has turf and a beautiful stadium that we're seeing on screen, it also has softball with turf and baseball with turf in 2A Humboldt. It, it's, it's quite incredible. Let's check in and see if we can get a score on this game. Guess we don't have a play-by-play uh, -play on this one. We thought we did. Again, it is Humboldt at home tonight. And you mentioned Walter Johnson Field. Of course, Humboldt, the home of the great Walter Johnson, one of the great pitchers in Major League Baseball history. I was at a baseball game in Washington, D.C. a few years ago, the Nationals, and they've got a big Walter Johnson uh, statue out there in the left field. As he's one of the, the greats for the Washington, the old Washington Senators, the original Washington Senators, which are now the Minnesota Twins. And back to uh, Canton Galva here. Canton Galva leading 56 to 24. Uh, trying to finish out this victory over Little River. Again, what we've mentioned several times, a much more competitive and close game than the final score will probably indicate as Canton Galva just finally kind of wearing down Little River in the fourth quarter and scoring a couple of unanswered touchdowns. That's been the difference. Before that, Little River always seemed to bounce back with a touchdown, but uh, just not enough in the end here. Canton Galva, number one team in eight-man division one. Wichita East has gone on to win 16 and 13 over Wichita Heights. The Blue Aces now 3 and 0 on the season. So they're kind of a story developing there in the Wichita City League. I saw I just caught some video on Twitter of their celebration. They were excited about that win tonight. Things got a little heated actually after <laughs> their celebration, but every, everything's okay. As, uh, I don't know if that again, was blocked or just off the side of his leg or, or what happened there, but kind of a. Yeah, goes out of bounds. There. 
We've got some more uh, final scores coming uh, across the state at scores in Kansas. Frankfurt beating Axtell tonight. That's a big win for that program, 36-14. to Baser Linwood beats Shawnee Heights, 47-16. to Lincoln beats the Rellers out of Harrington, 28-8. to Linden beats Anderson County, 56-6. to Anderson County experiencing some injuries, I believe, right now because at one point they're a team highlighted uh, that we thought could have a decent season. Phillipsburg beating Beloit, 49-28. Silver Lake beating Mission Valley, 56-14. Wichita West beating Wichita South, 29-8. And South Gray, where I spoke at uh, earlier today, and, and of course, uh, Montezuma, Kansas, uh, they won at home tonight, 30-12 to over Meade. Meade, of course, jumping down to eight-man uh, this season. Of course, a program that was very good in 2-1A and under Scott Mosier not that long ago. So Southeast of Saline, 32, Colby, 8, Hutch Trinity, 41, Marion, 0. These are final. Osage City, 64, Jayhawk Lynn, 6, Nemaha Central, 41, St. Mary's, 8, Rollins County out of Atwood, 46, Blue Valley Randolph, 0, Donovan West, 52, Maranatha, 0, Madison, 53, Oxford, 8, Leota, Wichita County, 58, Ness City, 8, Cedarville, Dexter, 56, and Yates Center, 42 as several scores go final across the state of Kansas. And we're checking in on Bishop Miege and St. James Academy. And you called this, Chet, early. This is a game that you said we should check in on because it might be a good one, and it is as uh, St. James Academy is hanging in there with Bishop Miege. It is 31-28, Miege on top. Here are seven uh, minutes, just over seven minutes left to go in the fourth quarter, Miege with the football. And Miege is 0-2 this year as well. Of course, they've played Aquinas and they've played Rockhurst, and now all of a sudden you play another private school here. But last year, you know, this was a game in week four, Leon, that was 28-27, to St. James winning, of course, on this same field as both of them play uh, here. I know they play in different spots, uh, you know, St. James does, depending on, on where the game's at. But – uh, this is an impressive performance for them because Miege does have some key weapons back. I know they lost a lot at the receiver position, and Bryson Cobbins was a four-year starter in the backfield. But you have your 3,000-yard quarterback back, uh, and you're still Bishop Miege. So this is a team that should be favored in this game, but not surprising that it's close like we talked off air uh, coming on because one year ago, uh, the Thunder were quite loaded last year. They had some really good players, including a really good linebacker fullback that now wrestles uh, of course, at North Carolina and one state last year over the, the kid out of Mace at 220 and several key weapons. So maybe it's a little bit of a surprise, but also it's going to be a surprise for a lot of 4A teams because both of those teams are going to be a factor on the east of 4A. And once again, uh, if you're looking, as you just mentioned, Bishop Miege has lost to Aquinas and Rocker. So if you're looking at their record and say, oh, what's wrong with Miege? You know, they, <laughs> they play a pretty uh, tough schedule, so they're going to be fine in the end, I think. As uh, Canton Galva just come of interception right there against uh, Little River, trying to close this one. Oh, no, Little River has scored. Has scored, my, my bad, as uh, they now trail 30. 56 to 32. Give it up to Little River. They have continued to battle in this game, but once again, they have uh, scored. They have yet to convert a two point conversion in this game. Oh, they just did. That's their first one. Okay. I'm com completely confused here as I've been bouncing around looking at all the different videos on our screen. That's my excuse. I'm <laughs> distracted right now, but as we're winding down action across the state of Kansas. From east to west and in the middle and all corners of the state we go on Kansas Football Friday, presented by Sports in Kansas. I'm the confused one, Leon Lebo, along with Chet Kaplan, who knows more about high school sports in Kansas than any man in Kansas alive. <laughs> alive. I don't know if that's a, a good thing <laughs> or, or a bad thing. Some final scores uh, coming in. Uh, Salinas Central picking up their first victory over the season. Have a nice quarterback in Parker Cavanaugh. Of course, his dad, Brian, former quarterback at Kansas State. They beat Ark City tonight, 33-27. Lacrosse Leopards, they are an eight-man this year. They beat Maxville 78-28 to in a high-scoring one uh, there. And also a big win for the Columbus Titans over Cherryville tonight, 42 -28. To 12 as well. They're undefeated. Not a lot of people are really talking about them in Southeast Kansas. Uniontown beating uh, Northern Heights tonight, 41 to nothing in that one. Fredonia beating Neota Shea, 35 to 20. Chanute 
and Independents have both been quarantined and Chanute winning 53-14 to 14. Uh, in that game tonight as uh, several scores across the state uh, go final. I know Riverton was leading Erie big uh, in that one. Some Southeast Kansas uh, final scores going final there tonight. And once again, we're checking in on right now Bishop Mies and St. James Academy. St. James Academy trying to come from behind and uh, trailing 31 to 28. 522 left to go in this game. And it looks like uh, St. James Academy, yes, will have the football on their own four yard line. They're going to have to do it the hard way to start this drive. Well, they're going to punt here. This is fourth down at 10 as I check out the scoreboard. And kind of a short snap and not really a quick kick. I think we knew he was going to kick it, just a, a short snap, maybe to prevent the ball from being blocked in the end zone, and that's going to go out of bounds and uh, will stay. Bishop Miege will be in uh, St. James uh, territory to start this drive. Almost could have thrown a longer interception in that one. How about this final out uh, between uh, 3A programs here? I don't know if this was in Goodland or Lindsburg, but Smoky Valley holds off Goodland tonight in two overtimes, 21 to 20. Wow. Low scoring game. We got the two overtimes in 21 to 20. So... But the win's a win. 31-28, Bishop Miege on top. 5-29 left to go against St. James Academy. St. James Academy, again, a relatively new school, but they certainly have made their presence known in the uh, sports world, especially with their volleyball teams over the years. They have a dynasty there, and uh, not just in Kansas, but they have a, a nationally ranked volleyball program. Yeah, they've been number one in the country before. We've seen Blue Valley West number one in the country. The, of course, you know, Lansing's had a good program for, for years as well under Coach Slater, who's now coaching at a smaller school after retiring and coming out of retirement at the last minute this year. And uh, volleyball is really good in Kansas City. We may have two, three teams ranked a year sometimes uh, in that top 25. And I know that, of course, uh, you know, Spectrum Sports up there, they broadcast some of those games and things like that. And good over on the Missouri side as well. Heck, uh, the girl last year for Lansing that plays at KU, her brother, one of the top recruits in the country for Lansing this year, uh, it's a junior, the Crawford girl. She was on an All-American, Under Armour All-American last year. And we've had girls play at Stanford, Nebraska, Illinois. Heck, KU's had a Final Four team. Uh, in recent memory as well. And you look at the, the girl at Gardner Edgerton this year that we had on Sports in Kansas All Access, uh, Kendra Waite. She's an outstanding track and field athlete, one of the best in the state, likely one of the best volleyball players going to Creighton. Of course, her brother was an All American pole vaulter at Kansas State, her sister, an All American volleyball player. And her dad, of course, was a seven foot high jumper at Frankfurt back in the day. So, uh, there's some really good volleyball going on in Kansas City. There's good volleyball in Wichita and, and even small town northeast Kansas. We talked about uh, Coach Tennell and, and all that he did and his wife as well, uh, both at, of course, Nemaha Valley back in the day and uh, now at, at Centralia. So a lot of really good volleyball in northeast Kansas, Kansas City. And Little River, give it up to uh, Little River. They continue to battle in this game against Canton Galva as it's about the end, but they just scored another touchdown. Failed again on the two-point conversion. That's going to make it 56-38 to with just uh, one second left to go. And Canton Galva will remain and defeat it at 5-0. and They'll move to 5-0 and as a Little River drops the 3-2. and But that's a good Little River football team as they really battled Canton Galva tonight. Back to Bishop Miege against St. James Academy. Stags trying to put another touchdown on the board here deep in St. James territory. And the runner knocked out around the six-yard line. And got some more final scores coming in to you across the state. Cimarron beating Syracuse tonight, 36-14. to Of course, uh, May South over Newton, 30-10. to Newton is uh, much improved, although the record doesn't show that. They've had some big-time stat leaders. Uh, Thomas Moore Prep, we saw them last week. They're much improved this year, winning 28-21 to over Ellis. Uh, Bonner Springs beating Ottawa, 37-21. Goddard. Uh, ends up pulling away from Eisenhower, 31 to 10 tonight, and uh, also a, a lot of other scores going final. You can check those out at Scores in Kansas. 
It has been a great night for high school football across Kansas. Competitive night. And again, Canton Galva just took the knee and uh, will take the 56-38 to victory over Little River. Uh, one of our, our feature games tonight, Michael Quay doing a terrific job covering that game for Kansas Football Friday as it was a great night. Well, check that out. There's still time left in this game. I, I misspoke. I thought there was... Uh, as they put another minute 55 on the graphic clock, and that clock always not always accurate. So Canton Galva now will try to run out the clock. As back to uh, Overland Park, actually back to uh, Bishop Meage uh, Stadium where uh, the St. James Academy Thunder lead, or trailing 31-28. Bishop Meage trying to uh, add to that score here. 347 got a trivia left in question the for quarter. Got a trivia oh. question for you, Leon. What is the name of the stadium at Bishop Miesch? Oh, man, I used to know this. I, I covered games there, and I cannot remember. <laughs> Dixon Dahl Stadium. Ah. I actually don't remember that. <laughs> it's in a neat little neighborhood. I do remember that. It's a, kind of a snug fit right Roland there. Roland Park. And, yeah, Roland Park in the – Neighborhood there, not too far from Shawnee Mission Parkway, just north of there. It's amazing in, in, in Kansas City or in Wichita, for that matter, specifically where, where I live in Wichita. I mean, it's crazy to me because I went to a 2A, 3A high school, and, and in some of these places I travel to now, you may have to drive an hour to find another 3A high school or a 2A high school or drive an hour to get to a Taco Bell or a Walmart or whatever it happens to be in some of these towns. And... You know, you see some of these places, and they're within five miles. There's like 10 6A schools, and it seems like every year we're opening up a new directional school out uh, in the Wichita area or Kansas City area and all that. It's wild. There is a huge uh, contrast in, in the state of Kansas between uh, maybe the rural and the urban areas, obviously. And uh, we mentioned before that how many 6A teams are on the east side of the state, and it's compared to the west side, and it's, it just uh, creates a different dynamic, I guess, for high school sports in the state of Kansas. They try to make it all work. I saw a, a bit of a story this week that coaches would not like uh, the district matchups or to be determined ge geographically. And uh, But it's just, I know they try to cut down on travel time, though, the Kansas State Activities Association. And that is the end of that game. Finally, Canton Galva has closed it out, 56-38. Again, a big score for Canton Galva, big margin of victory, but a, a close competitive battle between these two teams, Canton Galva over Little River. And again, the Eagles of Canton Galva now 5-0, top-ranked team in eight-man Division One. as they uh, no shaking hands, just greeting each other at midfield. And Good game, and it was a good game tonight, good competitive football game. Yeah, that eight-man stuff can be a, a little bit deceiving, as, as I mentioned, and a lot of people look at those scores. And, uh, you know, last year is a perfect example of that. We could have tuned in to that second quarter and saw that Canton Galva was getting killed 36 to nothing. And then you turn that on in the fourth quarter, and all of a sudden you see 66-36. It flips the side, and a lot can happen in a hurry with some adjustments and some big plays in eight-man football. And back to where Bishop Miege is trying to score, but we've got a timeout on the field again. Miege, the ball inside the five-yard line, leading 31-28 to over St. James Academy. This has been a good game as well. Fourth down and one, though. Bit of a decision here for Bishop Miege. As we head back to Humboldt, it looks like we interception on the play, and that ball brought to midfield Franklin at Humboldt. Humboldt, the home of Walter Johnson. You said you played on this uh, field, Humboldt Cubs. Did you guys have to hear a lot about Walter Johnson growing up down in southeast Kansas? Or is it... You know, I didn't hear a lot about it, but I, I kind of knew of it. Uh, but the field that we played on, and, you know, it was kind of cool because it was like walking back in time, but definitely didn't look like this really cool stadium here in a different part of kind of in town where this is kind of on the, the outskirts. But, uh yeah, it's, there's some definitely some rich baseball history down in that area where I'm from. Heck, you know, Commerce, Oklahoma is only about 35, 40 miles where well, I'm Mickey from with the great Mickey Mantle. And he played, uh, played with the Baxter, little, Baxter yeah. Springs 
Whiskits. Yeah, he played over on the Kansas side of the border. I always tell my Oklahoma friends that we could really claim Mickey Mantle a little bit. He played a lot of uh, foot or a lot of baseball in the state of Kansas. As at uh, Frankfurt or at that uh, Humboldt Franklin game, looks like it's a final. As they were, uh, it looks like they stopped him there on fourth and one. Wow, a big fourth time play one, there Bishop for St. James Yage. Academy. Going for it and did not get in. So St. James Academy will have the ball now deep in their own territory. 3.04 left to go. This is a good one. Wow. What a big defensive stand there from St. James Academy. Yeah, not a lot of not a lot of room around that stadium. Let's check in on the play by play here. Underneath over a 99 yard drive to win this football game with three minutes left. We'll see what they can do. Bishop Meage defense has come up big so many times in this game. Can they come up big one more time? The Thunder need a 100-yard drive. Here, they'll give it to Jimmy White on the first play of the drive, and he'll give them a little bit of breathing room here. Say they need a the long drive to win the game, but they also can tie the game. I'm not sure what kind of field goal kicker they have, but let's see if they can get in field goal range, and uh, that's part of the equation here as well, trailing by three, 31-28. Bishop Yage on top of St. James Academy. St. James with the ball deep in their own territory. No gain on that play, or about a yard gain is there at the their own three-yard line. They want to watch this drive. What the senior quarterback, Dakota Burke, can do, and he's going to look downfield and incomplete there, intended for Tyler Claiborne. Miege almost with the interception there. There looked to be a lot of contact on that play, although it was a high ball. Um... Tyler Claiborne looked to be almost dragged to the ground by the cornerback. Now third and eight coming up here for the Thunder and a big third and eight here. They still have two timeouts left, two and a half minutes left to go. Make sure to share this broadcast, sjathunder.org. The intensity of the crowd really picking up as this third and eight is huge. Burrett will throw it out. He's got Hayes Manning. He cannot go backwards as he'll get stopped, and this will be about a fourth and ten coming up now, maybe. Well, here's your game right here, obviously. Fourth down, and uh, it says fourth and eight on the board there, but two minutes, just a little over two minutes to go in the game. St. James Academy trying to get a first down here. And starting the drive, they stop Bishop Yeas from scoring on fourth and one. Trailing by three, they get the ball back, but they are deep in their own territory. And here it is, fourth down for St. James Academy. He draws up here as Dakota stands in his own end zone. Burrett, he's going to look for Claiborne. She can have a tackler, and it's incomplete. Great defensive stand here by Bishop Miege. And not there for St. James Academy. They go four and out. Bishop Meage will take over on downs and most likely, I would assume, run out the clock here. They could uh, score, but they are up 31 to 28. What do you think of the call there in fourth down? I kind of liked it actually going deep. You never might have a chance for a pass interference and uh, get that first down. Yeah, I think you go and you take the shot there and maybe unexpected. They thought maybe they'll go for first down. You got a little bit of clock, but you go for it. And you got to in a situation like this. Nobody's given St. James much of a chance in this game. I know Miege is 0-2, but everybody knows how good that Miege is and that the Stags in uh, really a, a really good football game here tonight as the Stags go in to extend this to make it look like it maybe wasn't as no, good a game as it was coming down here to the end. Yeah, they do score. I heard somebody in the in the uh, background yell, take a knee, but I guess uh, B.A. decides to score, and I'm not sure uh, how many timeouts, what the timeout situation was. There's still a minute 38 left to go when they uh, scored that touchdown. So a minute 35 now, and uh, they'll kick the extra point as they take the 37-28 to 28 lead. Hey, we've got some sad breaking news from the world of sports. Uh, Cardinals Hall of Famer Bob Gibson has died at the age of 84 after a bout with cancer. The former great St. Louis Cardinal pitcher Bob Gibson uh, dead at the age of 84. It's been a tough year for the Cardinals. Uh, that's the second uh, Hall of Famer they've lost in the last month. Lou Brock, of course, died earlier. Bob Gibson, a native of Omaha, Nebraska, a great basketball player at Creighton University. And uh, Bob Gibson, dead at the age of 84. So... There you go. As uh, we continue to keep up on going on on high school football, 
on this week number five as we see uh, Bishop Miege about to go on to defeat St. James Academy in a very good football game up there in Roland Park tonight. Yeah, really good game, and a lot of good games across the state. Even the Canton-Galva game and Little River that we had on tonight was great. I think the game that stood out to me the most tonight was the battle uh, that we saw there in of course, you know, Aquinas tonight uh, coming back uh, 21 unanswered in that one. And, of course, Shawnee Mission Northwest makes a push to come back and win it and goes for two and, and comes up short. So I think that that shows that they're a team in 6A for sure. Of course, Mill Valley making the bounce back uh, win tonight as well. Have a big game uh, tomorrow uh, with Bishop Carroll uh, and Lawrence. And it's also nice to see some teams out of quarantine. We talked about that WAC conference uh, we don't really know who the team is outside of Hayes. Hayes didn't play this week, but everybody thought Liberal wasn't very good. Liberal beat Garden City tonight, 20-6 to six at wow. home. So that was another one of those games where I know less about the whack tonight now after that, after seeing some things. So uh, we just never know week to week of, of course, what's going on uh, in the state, but still in the thick of district play and uh, ready to get back to – it's kind of hard to believe that we're going to be in week six next week, Leon. And we only have eight weeks of the regular season now. It's not like it used to be where we had nine weeks, uh, then playoffs. Week nine now is playoffs, play-in games, or, of course, you play those cross-district uh, games if you're one of those fifth- or sixth-place teams that don't make the playoffs. So week six, uh, but maybe week two or three or four or five, depending on what team you are. Yeah, as we get into this season further down the line, it seems like the games just get more competitive. And back to that Shawnee Mission Northwest Aquinas. Again, Aquinas coming back from that 28-14 to 14 deficit. And Northwest, I thought it was impressive that they were up by two touchdowns, but even more impressive is that they bounced back after – falling behind 35-28. to 28. They had two long pass plays, and then Ty Black, I guess, ran, the, ran it in for the touchdown. The two-point conversion, a gutsy call by Bo Black. Didn't get it. They lose by one. But, again, as you mentioned, Saint, or Shawnee Mission Northwest, uh, that's an impressive performance, win or lose tonight for the Cougars. Yeah, we have a lot of teams. We, we highlighted those teams on the 5A West that we talked about earlier with Connor Nickel and then you and I prior to that. Well, when we start looking at 6A football, there starts to become a list of teams as well. Uh, and 6A West is a little bit interesting because maybe Derby's not the same Derby. I still think that they're a team that's going to contend, could go deep, could win the whole thing. But all of a sudden, you got to factor in some teams like Lawrence that are on the west side of the state in football. Gardner Edgerton, who beat Mill Valley last week, is on the west side of the state. Uh, and then we get to the list of teams that we didn't even consider this year. Shawnee Mission Northwest is one of those. Clint Ryder and Blue Valley Northwest are one of those teams. Uh, and then, of course, the traditional teams like Blue Valley, even Blue Valley North, who has came on strong over the last five years or so under Coach Sim. So there's certainly that short list of contenders is kind of extended, 6A, 5A. Uh, when we look down at 4A, who's that team on the West? We don't know. We think that 4A East – We'll come down to maybe the game we just saw on our screen tonight. Uh, will Paola or Taganoxie, who we've already seen this year, battle for that? Or will it be St. James and Miege, as we said? You go down to 3A, I think Andel's that team to look at. You look at the 3A, of course, on the eastern side. Is that Perry LeCompton? Will they get Topeka Hayden this year? They're battling, a, of course, their quarterback being out with an injury, but they have a solid cast of players. And 2A football, Rossville and Silver Lake, the war on 24. The eastern part of the state, those teams are outstanding. Hoisington may be that team out west this year. 1A football, Smith Center is Smith Center, but Conway Springs down to that conversation. Centralia, the state champ last year. And, of course, an eight-man, Connor Nickel talked about that with Leota, Wichita County. Could they be the team out west this year to play Canton Galva maybe in that state title? An eight-man, two. I think it's the St. Francis team that's going to get all the way this year. They bump down to that classification. And then whenever we look on the, the eastern part, Hanover flexed its muscles last week and beat Axtell. Axtell lost again this week to Frankfurt. So certainly those are kind of the short list of contenders that I have across the state. But, Leon, as we know it, that could change week to week as we approach week number six. It has been a crazy season, obviously, because of the pandemic, but it has looked like it's shaping up to be a very fun season, so competitive all across the, the, the state in all the classes, and it has been fun to follow, and we will continue to follow it as we'll have week number six next week. As that's going to do it for this uh, edition of Kansas Football Friday presented by Sports in Kansas. For my co-host, Chet Kuplin, our producer and director, Mike Nelson, our field producer and live-action producer, Michael Quaid, 
And on graphics from the home office in Atlanta, Georgia, Paul Nelson. I'm Leon Liebel. We'll see you next week here on Kansas Football Friday. Good night, everybody. At Lewis Automotive Group, our pre-owned inventory is dwindling. With no auctions, it's been difficult to replenish our stock. So we're offering big money for your trade. In most cases, we can get you into a newer vehicle with fewer miles with no change to your payment. Have a vehicle you just don't use? We want to buy that too. So we're offering free appraisals. Stop into any Lewis location and trade in and trade up. Or get cash money for your car or truck during our pre-owned buyback event at Lewis Automotive Group, Dodge City, Garden City, Liberal, and Hayes.